Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our 2021 Litter Summit with the Ohio Department of Transportation, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. My name is Helen Miller with the Ohio EPA, and I will be moderating this morning's sessions. This next slide has the agenda for this morning. As you can see, we have four sessions. Between sessions, we will take a 15 minute break, then resume. Please feel free to continue sending in questions during the breaks. This morning, the summit will highlight a statewide litter study where the Davie Resource Group will share their findings on behaviors and beliefs about litter in Ohio. During this summit, you will also hear from a variety of stakeholders on the impact of litter. You will be introduced to Ohio's litter campaign, A Little Litter is a Big Problem, and this aims to educate Ohioans about the effects of litter on our environment and seeks to change public behavior to prevent litter. Governor Mike DeWine will now kick off our summit with the keynote address. On November 6, 2018, Governor DeWine was elected to serve as the 70th governor of the state of Ohio. The governor has had a long and distinguished career in public service, focusing on protecting Ohio children and families. He was previously the 50th Attorney General of Ohio and has previously been elected to serve as Greene County Prosecutor, Ohio State Senator, U.S. Congressman, Ohio Lieutenant Governor, and U.S. Senator. I'd like to welcome Governor DeWine virtually for our keynote address. Good morning. Thank you so much for attending the 2021 Litter Summit. I know you care about making our communities our roads, our natural resources, and our state as litter-free as possible. You know, and I know, that a little litter is a big problem. With increased visitation in our state parks during the pandemic, we've seen more litter. And it certainly is expensive to clean up. ODOT, for example, has spent more than $48 million picking up trash in the past decade. Last year, ODOT employees spent more than 151,000 hours picking up litter. We need to change this in Ohio. On Earth Day, I launched the campaign, A Little Litter is a Big Problem. The campaign's goal is to help Ohioans understand the impact their litter can have on all of us and on our beautiful state. Partnering with each of you will help make this campaign successful. So thank you in advance for your efforts. Yes, a little litter is a big problem, but I know that together we can help pave a better, cleaner path ahead for Ohio and for all Ohioans. Thank you, Governor DeWine, for helping us kick off our litter summit this morning. Next up, I would like to welcome the ODOT team. They will be highlighting the ODOT litter study and discussing behaviors and beliefs surrounding litter. We will also hear highlights from the 2020 National Litter Study. Our first presenter is Director Jack Marchbanks with the Ohio Department of Transportation. Director Marchbanks was appointed by Governor Mike DeWine to this post in 2019. He has also served as Assistant Director for Business and Human Resources at ODOT. As assistant director, he was responsible for the overall management of the department's 5,000 employees and development of its $3.3 billion budget. Director Marchbanks has also served as District 6 deputy. During his long time at District 6, he oversaw the investment of more than $1.7 billion in surface transportation infrastructure. A lifelong learner, Dr. Marchbanks recently earned a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Ohio University. He also holds an MBA from Xavier University in Cincinnati, a master's degree from Clark Atlanta University, and he is a proud graduate of the University of Dayton, where he earned his bachelor's degree in political science. Now I'd like to turn the mic over to Director Marchbanks. Thank you, Helen. And I'm sure I speak for everyone on, on this important uh, summit when I say thanks to Governor DeWine for his leadership on this important issue. 
let's get started. One of the most annoying and unfortunate responsibilities the women and men of ODOT undertake is pick it, picking up discarded trash along our roadways. It's an annoyance because litter is a 100% preventable issue, and our forces would much rather be focused on keeping the state's roads and bridges in good repair. An irritating fact is that every year they have to divert their attention from important maintenance work to pick up other people's trash. This deviation from more critical work duties could be avoided if people would simply put their trash where it belongs and secure items before being hauled. Let's move to the next slide. Last year, ODOT crews collected nearly 363,000 bags of other people's trash from along Ohio's roadways. That's enough trash to put nearly 3.5 bags in each seat at Ohio Stadium. I'm sure a sight no one would want to see on opening day. Every single bag represents something that could have been prevented with a better choice. Litter is not only ugly, it's costly. When ODOT or an adopt a highway volunteers or inmates are collecting other people's trash, there is a real cost. On average, we spend about $4 million annually to cover salaries, guards, and portable toilets for inmates, materials like trash bags and litter pickers, and disposal of all the collected trash. Next slide. If the litter problem could be eliminated, consider this, if the litter problem could be eliminated, we could double our safe routes to schools budget. These projects make it safer for students to walk and bike to school. We all know that increasing walkable and bikeable places enhances entire communities and improves the quality of life here in the great state of Ohio. Next slide. When you factor in all levels of government involved in litter pickup, those costs grow to an astounding $41 million, $41 million annually. Litter is not only ugly and costly, it can also be dangerous. Improperly discarded trash often plugs our roadside drainage system or flies into vehicles. When there's a heavy rain and water pools on our roadways, most of the time, the litter clogs, drains, and is the culprit in some of that water pooling back up. Our crews often find paper cups, plastic bottles, fast food bags, and other items that have been tossed from vehicles. Unsecured loads can shift and fall and hit vehicles, sometimes resulting in serious injuries or worse. Next slide. Our message today is simple. It might seem like a little bit of litter to you, but it's becoming a big, big problem. Trash cans are abundant. They're at nearly every gas station I've ever visited. People have them in their homes. All restaurants or other public places people visit have them. It's important to take advantage of the opportunity to use them. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but we have to take advantage of that opportunity. It's critical that trash is disposed in the proper place, not on our roadsides. And it's equally important to make sure loads being hauled are tied down and covered so they don't fly out of a vehicle and endanger other motorists. Next slide. One of the most important steps in addressing this trash, tr trash issue is to understand where and what types of litter are the most prevalent. This is why we commissioned a litter study in 2019 to gather quantitative and qualitative data on littering in Ohio. The results of that survey are definitely illuminating. The pandemic delayed our plans to release them, but we are pleased to go through them with you to all today. First, I would like to introduce Cheryl Daniels from Davy Resource Group. Davy conducted the litter study on behalf of ODOT, and Cheryl is here to give you all an overview of what that study found. Again, Helen, everyone, on this webinar, thank you so much for being interested in improving the quality of life here in Ohio and getting rid of litter as a problem. Thank you, Director Marchbanks. We'll now hear presentations by Cheryl Daniels and David O'Cam. Cheryl Daniels is a senior project manager at Davy Resource Group. She's principal investigator on a research project for ODOT to create model guidance, 
modeling guidance on the safe and efficient removal and disposal of dead ash trees. She is also co-principal investigator on a research project for ODOT to evaluate and develop native ground cover mixes that are beneficial to pollinators and meet erosion goals. Ms. Daniel works in utility forestry, urban forestry, and the natural resource management industries. She recently led a research team on ODOT statewide litter study and is currently working on a similar project for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. David Ocam is Chief Research and Planning Officer at GDC Marketing and Ideation. Mr. Ocam represents the end consumer at the agency and advocates to ensure all campaign messaging and activities are designed and executed to inspire change in their beliefs and behaviors. In this role, he oversees all research projects and uses these results, as well as other data to uncover insights. At GDC, his work has included research projects in traffic safety, hospitals and healthcare, education, banking, voter education, retail, restaurants, and countless other sectors. David has worked on litter research projects involving litter prevention for the Texas Department of Transportation, the Minnesota Department of Transportation, and ODOT. I will now pass the mic to Cheryl. Thank you, Helen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today to hear about the statewide litter study our team completed for Ohio Department of Transportation in 2019. Um, I may end up turning the, my camera off here if I notice some lag, so just a heads up on that. But um, yes, yeah, Helen mentioned, I work with Davey Resource Group and we are an Ohio-based environmental consulting company that in 2004 completed a statewide litter survey for Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And then in 2019, DRG, Davy Resource Group, teamed up with Environmental Resource Planning. I may refer to them as ERP as I speak. They're a firm that specializes in litter surveys and cost studies and has completed them for many cities and states such as Texas and New Jersey. The third partner in our team, uh, Helen mentioned, GDC Marketing and Ideation. They are a firm well-versed in public relations and marketing, including the Don't Mess with Texas Litter campaign. GDC was tasked with answering the questions of why people litter and what marketing messages are effective to reduce littering. Unfortunately, Steve Sign, the principal with ERP, is unable to attend today, but David Ocam with GDC is presenting with me. Okay, so you might ask, why do another litter study? Well, there are 400,000 bags of litter cleaned up from highway rights of way annually at a cost to ODOT of over $4 million a year. Now that's just within ODOT rights of way and just ODOT's costs. The number of bags collected, the direct costs, and the hours associated with litter collection has stayed fairly steady over the last 10 years. ODOT's highway technicians who perform much of the litter cleanup are skilled workers who have other responsibilities to tend to, responsibilities that help maintain safe conditions along the roadway. ODOT alone spends over $4 million annually to pick up litter, but more resources are needed to effectively reduce litter. There are additional costs that other entities spend in cleanup and other social costs that we'll also talk about. Litter in Ohio is treated with a reactive approach, so ODOT wanted to know, is there a better way? So the purpose of the study was to determine the composition of litter on ODOT maintained roadways, to determine the attitudes and behavior of the public, determine the costs of litter, and find out how other state departments of transportation are funding their litter programs with the goal of helping ODOT locate funding to pay for the costs of cleanup along the roadways. So we'll talk about the project goals. They were first to gather data on littering in Ohio through qualitative and quantitative means. So we were to gauge and score public perceptions and attitudes on litter and to survey highway litter volume and composition. 
to make recommendations to ODOT on how to move from a litter abatement strategy to litter prevention, to utilize focus groups and survey findings to find the source of the problem, to draw from other state DOT programs for litter campaign funding and procedures, and to create a roadmap for a statewide litter prevention campaign to reduce roadside litter and cleanup costs. The map on the right here shows each of ODOT's regions, and we looked at sample sites in each of the regions. So the first task in the project was to do a statewide litter survey. So we did a field-based survey ahead of the first spring litter cleanup activities in February and March of 2019. There were a total of 71 sites representative of Ohio and its five major metropolitan areas. Each site was 1,500 feet long and 18 feet deep, so that a total area of more than 1.8 million square feet was sampled. Litter over one square inch in size was tallied at each site. Litter was tallied and recorded by 104 different components. They were then rolled up into 14 major categories, which are shown here with examples of each one. The material composition of each component was also recorded. Beverage containers were the largest category of litter, 18%. Interestingly, 5.2% of all litter was beer cans, which is higher compared to the other seven states ERP has surveyed in the last five years. Those other states came in between 1.6 and 4%, with Utah being excluded as much, was much lower than 1.6%, which could be expected. Vehicle debris was the second largest category at 16.7%. Paper and beverage containers made of recyclable materials accounted for 31.7% of litter. In a comparison to the seven other litter surveys completed by ERP since 2017, ODOT's top four litter categories were pretty typical. While some categories of litter are found in higher quantities than others, it's important to remember that the individuals inappropriately disposing of these products are the cause of the litter. So let's look at the sources of litter. So based on ambient site conditions, the proximity of various litter-related factors, such as proximity of locations that sell items that are often littered, and the types of litter found at each site, over time it's become possible to ascertain the likely sources of litter at each site. Using this model in Ohio, items tossed out of cars and trucks are the largest source of roadside litter. Construction and vehicle debris are also significant sources. I'm now going to turn it over to David Ocam to go over his team's findings with attitudes and behavior regarding litter. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, let me see if I have control. I think I do. Perfect. So Cheryl's kind of gone through some of the measurements of the litter at the side of the road, the measurement of what litter is out there. So let's turn our attention now to who's doing the litter, the litterers themselves, and the study of those individual people. I want to call your attention really quick to the time that this study was conducted, February through April of 2019, for both our polling and our focus groups. Typically, in terms of the in terms of the time, yes, the biggest issue here is this is pre-COVID. And so obviously with COVID, we've done a lot of recent uh, studies and, and things obviously during the COVID times changed as well as afterwards, we have some pretty interesting changes in mindset. And so I just wanna draw attention that this is a pre-COVID study. So our first four goals of this were to measure and understand how Ohioans feel about littering and its impact on their communities to determine what individuals consider litter and their perception of the severity of each type of litter, to ascertain which factors make an individual most likely to become a litterer, and to understand what circumstances these individuals are most likely to litter. 
An additional two uh, goals and objectives are to actually measure their persuasiveness of messaging, to increase perceptions of both severity of littering, and to encourage individuals to properly dispose of litter. And so we did that through our polling and through what's called a regression analysis. I'll get into that in a little bit. And then through our focus groups, we wanted to understand why these messages resonated and identify any potential noise that could be found in the message that could distract from the messaging. And ideally, and we were able to actually accomplish this, identify in the emotional trigger point, that platform that actually resonates and allows these messages to succeed and create a gut values connection. And so here's our methodology. On the quantitative side, we conducted a poll of a representative sample of 400 Ohioans using online panels and then added in an additional 300 over sample of individuals 16 to 34 years old. The reason we did this is through all of our experience in the litter realm, we've discovered that these individuals typically are, and they were in this instance, most likely to litter. And so we wanted to be able to do a deeper dive into them to identify specific factors, geographic, demographic, behavioral, psychographic, that could impact and help us with targeting. And so we needed that oversample to be able to really dig deep into the data set there. And then on the qualitative side, we conducted three focus groups, two in the Columbus area, one with an 18 to 24 year old consort and one with a 25 to 40 year old consort and one focus group in the Toledo area at a 25 to 40 year old uh, consort. Within those focus groups, we over indexed for smokers, making sure they were at least 25 percent of each group. And as you'll see later through the quantitative, we identified smokers as a high likely uh, litter audience. And ironically, not just for the litter uh, cigarette butts themselves, but for other types of litter as well. And we also wanted parents with children in the household. Uh, we want to make sure that in our 25 to 40 year old groups, at least half of the groups were that. And it's an interesting play here because um, parents are the greatest influence on their child and making sure that the child is acculturated not to litter. But also we've discovered, and this is super interesting interesting to me, that parents are influenced by their children. And so a program that reaches out to the kids and gets the kids to tell their parents not to litter is highly effective at influencing the parents' behavior. And so that's kind of cool. Um, we also wanted to make sure that half of each of the, the focus groups was from the representative urban county, and then half was from a surrounding exurban or rural county to make sure that we got some kind of a geographic uh, representation here. And we also wanted to make sure we had a mix of race, gender, and socioeconomic status within the groups. Okay, so I'm gonna go over some key findings here. I could speak for hours and hours and then you'd see a hook pulled and me pulled off the stage here, but no, I'm gonna keep it pretty broad with just key findings uh, that we uh, came up with through these two studies. The first key finding is the public responds negatively to litter. 82% of the respondents in our poll believed that litter is either a somewhat serious or a very serious problem. 82%, eight out of 10 Ohioans said, this is a problem in Ohio, that litter is either somewhat serious or a very serious problem. Okay, so we did a few of these visual stimulus tests, right? And what a visual stimulus test is in this instance is we had two images that are pretty much the exact same. A park setting is what you see in front of you. We did a beach setting as well. The only difference between the two is one had litter and one did not have litter. And so what we uncovered is that the public responded extremely negatively towards the images with litter. Like universally, every single respondent identified that they preferred the location without visible litter. Without prompting as to why, they identified the litter as that reason that that scene would be unappealing. And then when we dug deeper into it, they indicated they would not visit the litter destination because of litter, that the, they would not travel, they would be far less likely to go on a trip to that location. They just had a visceral gut reaction here. And so a lot of this, you're probably thinking, well, duh, if I saw that image, I'd think the same thing too. But when we do studies, we do a lot of work and some of our work is in the travel and tourism sector. We ask people, well, what's a reason you would go to destination A or to over destination B? And in those type of settings, what they typically would say would be some of the advertised things, right? That it has better, like you guys have a ton of amusement parks. So it would be like, you have better rides, you have better this, you have better that, right? But what we actually uncover in a study like this is there's a thing that's subconscious that's in the background that even with all of the things that people like rationally explain away, when it comes to litter, if it's there, your gut reaction pushes you away without you even realizing you're being pushed away. And so from a travel tourism perspective, litter is extremely important. 
Okay, next key finding. Not all litter is equal in public's perception. So the public actually looks at litter based on three key factors. The first and most important key factor is the potential to harm a person or an animal. That's the most severe litter. The next one is how offensive it is aesthetically, either through sight or through smell. If it smells funky or it looks awful, that's the next uh, level, right? And then the final level that people look at is how it impacts the earth, the whole biodegradable issue, right? And so when we conducted the study, we looked at it through both the polling and through the focus groups. We identified the public thought that glass, large plastic, aluminum cans, and styrofoam are the most severe forms of litter, with the least severe forms of litter being organic material like banana peels, apple cores, that kind of thing, and then small paper products. The most frequently littered items, um, and this is uh, by the percentage of pu uh, public that had littered them in the past month, were small pieces of paper, organic materials, and then cigarette butts. But I want to draw your attention to cigarette butts here because you're at 15% and you're thinking to yourself, that's not that high. Well, 53% of smokers said they had littered their cigarette butts in the past month. So amongst that segment of the audience who smokes, this is a gargantuanly huge problem. Okay, key finding number three. Some people are far more likely to litter than other people. And so by this, we think of ourselves, right, like within drinking water, right? You think, okay, all of us as human beings are equally likely to drink water at 100%, right? And But when it comes to littering, some people are far, far, far more likely to engage in this behavior than other people. So 42% of Ohioans have littered in the past month. Okay, so four out of 10. However, 66% of tobacco users littered something in the past month. And what I wanna draw your attention to is it's not just cigarette butts. Once you've been acculturated to flick your butt out the window, you're also acculturated to throw other things out the window as well. And so cigarette and tobacco users have been habituated into this behavior and they are doing it for their cigarette butts, but they're also doing it for other items. And so 58% of Ohioans 16 to 24 have littered in the past month. So age is a huge indicator of if your likelihood to litter. And, age in, and as age increases, as you get older, your likelihood to litter dramatically decreases. Okay, fourth key finding here. The public does not recognize that the state of Ohio takes littering seriously. And I want to underscore something here, that this is not indicative of what Ohio is actually doing. I'm measuring the public's perception of what Ohio is doing. And so the public as a whole does not understand or realize that Ohio is taking littering seriously, that Ohio is doing a lot in the realm of littering whatsoever. 81% of Ohioans understand that littering is illegal in all instances. However, 61% of Ohioans believe that litter laws are never or rarely enforced. And so that's to say that six out of 10 Ohioans believe that law enforcement is not going to either ever or very, very rarely enforce the laws that they believe are on the books. Okay, and so when we get into the whole concept of who picks up litter, like obviously participants in the groups think it's gonna be the free prison labor. And you and I, and everyone I think in this um, oh, summit here knows prison labor is not free. And actually prison labor to pick up litter costs more money than contract labor because of the guards and because of the other things that have to be put in place. The public doesn't understand this at all, though. The public thinks that it's free because you have the prisoners and they're already out there. And so it's absolutely free to pick up litter and that, frankly, they deserve it. This is a punishment. You did a crime. Now you do your time. And part of your time is doing that pickup of the litter. And they don't get that this costs money. And they don't get that that's not actually the majority of what's picking up litter whatsoever. So they have no concept that picking up litter costs money. Okay, in terms of public information and education campaigns, 72% of respondents have not seen, read, or heard any littering messaging whatsoever. And so you're thinking to yourself here, well, that does mean that 28% have. No, 28% not haven't necessarily seen, read, or heard. They just think they have in the same way that I may have thought I heard another message here. 
And so that's why in the focus groups we say, okay, so you said you heard, saw, or um, read a litter messaging. What was it? Zero. Zero people came up with any actual campaign whatsoever. And so in terms of understanding messaging, there is almost no recognition in Ohio whatsoever of a campaign ongoing, which makes sense because there was no campaign currently running in Ohio. Um, and 71%, and this is super interesting to me, 71% of respondents felt the state of Ohio should do more to prevent litter. And so this is an instance where the public actually wants you to act. The public is clamoring for the state to do more and to be visible in this issue. And so by doing a forward facing litter campaign, you're giving the state what they want. And it is going to have a halo effect around the state as a whole for doing this. OK, so I mentioned we're getting into this message testing. Here we are in the message testing. And so without getting too deep in the weeds, I want to kind of explain briefly on a top line level what our practice is and how we introduce message testing. And so we don't want to just come up with messages that are popular. So we have an initial ballot. And for this instance, we did a ballot against um, how likely are you to litter? And then we also did a ballot on how serious do you think litter is? And so we have that initial ballot. We did an entire battery of various types of messages. And then on the back end, we did another ballot, the same exact question, how serious do you think litter is and how likely are you to litter? And then we analyzed what changed the behavior and we ran what's called a regression analysis to be able to identify those messages that weren't just popular, but were actually effective at change, at either increasing the awareness of the importance uh, or that littering is bad or changing their behavior specifically that they will no longer litter. And these are the two messages that popped. Contrary to what many people think, prisoners are not picking up most of the litter. Most often, the burden of litter cleanup falls on your tax dollars or on volunteers in your community. And then every year, the Ohio Department of Transportation spends $4 million to pick up litter. That money could be better used to pave a two-lane, 10-mile roadway. What do these two have in common? It's about the cost. It's about the fact that Ohio is spending money to do the litter clean our litter cleanup efforts. And if we didn't litter, we wouldn't have to spend that money and we could spend that money better elsewhere. OK, so I also mentioned we went into focus groups. We tested for noise. But what we also do in focus groups is we want to identify a platform. Right. And so when I mean platform, I mean that emotional trigger point. I want to create that gut values connection that just makes you feel it, right? You've all seen, and it's not every ad, right? It's the rare ad where you feel a pull, you feel a tug, you feel something that pulls you in and makes you want to act at that like subconscious gut like level. That's what a platform does, right? And so we did the dig, we understood the audience, and we found out its respect. And I want to draw a huge distinction between some of the work we've done in Texas with the Don't Mess With Texas campaign. That's all about pride. And you're like, well, pride, respect, it's similar, but it's totally different. If you've met a Texan, and I lived in Texas for a very, very, very long time before moving up to D.C., they're prideful. They have a ton of pride in Texas, and they're going to let you know Texas is the best, Texas is the best. I mean. You've seen their football team. They're not the best, yet they certainly believe they're the best. Respect is different. Respect is something that you have about yourself, about your family, about your land. You have ownership, and because it's yours, you respect that item, right? And so versus me just telling you all this, I want to go through some verbatims, right, on what people in the groups actually said about respect that really helps it to sink in on um, why any message platform needs to really focus and fixate on that respect angle. They said, if you respect something, you try to clean up after yourself. I mean, you don't throw your trash into your yard, so why would you do it here? You should have respect for where you live and not make it trashy. It's a lack of respect for things, and that's a lack of respect for other people. I mean, to go, I'll just throw this out the car window, what does it matter? It just looks like whoever was there didn't respect that area very much. It's kind of like a respect thing in my mind. 
I think there's just some frustration to, uh, there towards whoever must have dropped that trash there of you didn't respect this space for other people or for the environment your, itself. I mean, when you listen to the groups over and over and over again, unaided, respect resonated, respect popped. And for Ohio and for the mindset of an Ohioan, this issue is all about respect. And so now that we've kind of gone through the messaging, we've kind of gone through a measurement of the people. I'm going to toss it over to Cheryl to discuss some of the interesting findings in regards to cost. Thank you, David. So as part of the research, the team investigated funding and costs associated with litter abatement. The slide refers to the costs paid by government entities and educational institutions. You can see between the state, counties, and municipalities, Ohio government entities expend $41.8 million per year, while school districts and universities pay the highest litter cost per capita. We also took a look at the indirect costs within Ohio and the potential revenue due to the effects of litter. Litter costs Ohio business community $408 million per year. Tourism is a sector with the largest potential revenue loss and is consistent with the focus group results David went over. As you recall, focus group participants did not want to visit areas that were littered. Now let's look at litter funding. As you can see on the chart on the left, until 2008, there was a litter tax in Ohio that contributed as much as $1.4 million per year to clean up litter. In 1998, a litter control and recycling fund financed by the manufacturing community was established as an alternative to a beverage container deposit, which several other states utilize. In 2002, the Litter Control and Recycling Fund changed names to Recycling and Litter Control Fund to reflect a change in the disbursement of monies from this fund. Then in 2006, when manufacturers no longer supported this fund through a levy, funding dramatically decreased from an average of $11 million per year between 1998 and 2005 to $3.9 million per year when supported through a surcharge on construction and demolition tip fees. In 2005, the combined average was 99 cents per capita and was the second lowest surcharge in the country. In 2013, this budgetary light item was transferred from the Ohio Department of Natural Resources to the Ohio EPA. The fund is now primarily being used for recycling and market development efforts. Let's look at how Ohio compares to other states. Ohio has the seventh largest gross domestic product in the US, providing potentially significant resources to draw upon when considering opportunities to fund effective litter abatement programs. Such programs are an important investment that would support Ohio's efforts to grow economically. But Ohio does not have a consistent dedicated litter funding source. In states with consistent litter program funding, they are seeing the benefits to their litter abatement programs. For example, our team's very familiar with the programs in New Jersey and Texas through research and repeated surveys. For the last 17 years, New Jersey's litter tax has provided a dedicated funding source and is currently at $22 million. Texas's program has had consistent funding for the last 35 years and is currently set at $49 million annually. 
These states are seeing the benefits from consistent funding associated with their litter prevention campaigns and reduction in litter found throughout the state. Both litter programs are well known within their states. New Jersey has a broad and consistent grassroots program, while Texas has a well-known state-run program. Why do you need a consistent program? Because people need to hear the message regularly to get it ingrained in their litter disposal practices, to have continuity and build a culture around it as new people move in and out of the state and as the demographics change. So I think that might resonate with uh, what you heard David say earlier about habituation where smokers are throwing cigarette butts as well as other items out of the window and how Texas has this whole mantra now around the don't mess with Texas campaign. So those are really well known within the state and really um, build support around the program. Now those two states, these budgets are a good size but the states are seeing a return on the investment in terms of growth as well as business, growth in business and tourism. So let's look at funding in other states. GDC took a look at this by doing um, polls and in-depth interviews. They looked at funding levels and sources as well as the use of funds. First, they did a poll with 48 participants, including state departments of transportation and Keep America Beautiful affiliates. Then they spoke with seven DOTs and two Keep America Beautiful state directors for those in-depth interviews. They found that between 1.5 and $18 million was available in funding, mostly through state funding. Some states, had funding through from illegal dumping fees or taxes on beverage companies. Most funding was a general appropriation to the DOT, usually through a gas tax. And then there was a limited amount of funding that came from sponsor highway programs. Now, as far as using the funds, they found that the litter prevention budget did not correlate with the size of the overall litter program budget. Partnerships help amplify the anti-littering message and public information education campaigns promoted the message. They found that the majority of funding went to cleanup efforts. For example, the state with the highest litter fund at $18 million did not have a prevention budget um, and the highest performing states had partnerships and education campaigns. So some of the key conclusions. Programs with robust public information and education efforts tended to have one person as a point of contact for all litter abatement efforts. They had a dedicated funding source, which led to an increased ability to conduct consistent public information and education campaigns. And there was significant opportunity to leverage partners for more than just manpower. So I'll give you an example. In Texas, litter bags are handed out in grocery stores. In Tennessee, rather, litter bags are handed out in grocery stores, whereas in Texas, they work with a gas station chain to amplify litter abatement messaging. So let's get into recommend, the recommendations that came out of the study. From the field surveys to the public polls and focus groups, the research of costs of litter to Ohio and to the other state polls and in-depth interviews, we saw some common threads that emerged as the top recommendations for the state of Ohio to implement to reduce litter. First, the state should create a statewide litter program. A statewide program can be more comprehensive than the current single agency approach. The program should have a single point of contact for all public information and education efforts with a dedicated source of meaningful funding for litter education, abatement, and cleanup activities. Meaningful funding would be similar to the 1998 to 2005 levels. 
and the program should measure the effectiveness of the campaign by conducting another litter study about five years after implementation of a litter campaign. And the program should also have a good outreach component. The outreach will help Ohio move from a reactive to a proactive approach to reduce litter. It will illustrate to the public that the state of Ohio does take litter prevention seriously. It would utilize a fully integrated marketing and communications campaign, and it should target those most likely to litter, such as those 16 to 24 year old drivers and smokers that David talked about. The focus, or fo focus should be on a litter campaign, prevention campaign on those most frequently found litter items, such as better beverage containers and vehicle construction debris. And the program should be promoted with spokespersons. The campaign should use diverse creative elements for various demographic groups, such as public service announcements, billboards, digital media assets, and post on items such as gas pump toppers and signage on garbage and recycling cans. It should obtain media sponsorships at high profile events, such as concert series, sports teams, et cetera. As you recall, David talked about how respect came out as a major theme when conducting focus groups in Ohio. So those participants uh, found that respect really resonated with them and, and messages that uh, worked really well were litter cleanup is costly and there are better ways to spend our taxpayer money than picking up trash. The state should also continue partnerships, working more closely with law enforcement and code enforcement to prevent littering, whether intentional or not through things like unsecured loads. Should continue to build partnerships with government entities, environmental groups, and companies to promote litter education, abatement, and cleanup. And to promote programs such as Adopt a Highway. It should continue the beneficial partnerships with organizations such as Adopt a Highway and Keep Ohio Beautiful, as well as corporations. Corporate partnerships encourage social responsibility and allow for co-branding. They could come in the form of funding, man hours, and promotion of the campaign on products. For example, a partnership with a grocery store can promote the campaign by including the campaign messages on grocery bags. Partners could also offer redemption on their products at a company or industry level. Additionally, opportunities exist to work with communities to reduce residential litter by replacing open top garbage and recycling bins with carts with attached lids. Also, also, there's the opportunity to encourage the reduction of single use water bottles by offering refill stations at water fountains. Okay, so let's talk about some specific items that we found uh, recommendations for ODOT. ODOT should investigate alternative sources of funding for litter abatement efforts, should utilize existing ODOT highway beautification program as a point of contact for litter management efforts, and schedule litter removal events prior to mowing events by the county. Timing litter cleanup prior to mowing can eliminate turning one piece of trash scattered into hundreds across the roadside. It should require removal of car parts from accidents by towing and recovery companies rather than just leaving them along the road. It should continue to maintain partnerships with the law enforcement, correctional institutions, and organizations such as Adopt a Highway. It should also distribute meshed stamped litter bags at rest stops and way stations. And of course, it's very important to track metrics to measure success levels. Those metrics can be used to provide data for the next litter study which will evaluate the overall success of the program.
More details from today's presentation can be found in the report we prepared for ODOT. On behalf of Davey Resource Group, Environmental Resource Planning, and GDC Marketing and Ideation, I want to thank you for your time and attention today. Thank you, Cheryl and David, for your great presentations. Next up, we have David Scott with Keep America Beautiful. David is Director of Research, Monitoring, and Evaluation at Keep America Beautiful. He oversees research in support of the Keep America Beautiful mission, along with the data and evaluation strategies to help understand the impact of the organization and its network of more than 600 community-based affiliates. For more than two decades, he has worked at the intersection of data, analytics, evaluation, and technology to demonstrate the social impact of nonprofits, corporations, and foundations. I will now pass the mic to David. Thanks so much, Helen. Uh, nice to see everybody. Uh, um, just saying hi here on camera, but I will uh, turn that off so that everybody can focus on the data because that's what we're all here for today. And I'm thrilled to be with you here today to talk about uh, the Keep America Beautiful 2020 National Litter Study and to provide some highlights uh, from the study. Oops, a little, tr little trigger happy there, sorry. Uh, um, so for those who aren't familiar, Keep America Beautiful is uh, the nation's largest community improvement organization. Uh, you know, our mission is to inspire and educate people to take action every day to improve and beautify their community environment. And we believe that when we take on that shared responsibility, uh, we can build and maintain clean, green and beautiful spaces. Uh, and through Collective Impact, we uh, uh, um, the part of our new effort here is to get folks across the country to realize that through our work uh, together that we can ensure that everybody uh, in America lives in a beautiful community. So why litter matters? This audience probably doesn't need to hear this, of course, uh, um, but for more than six decades, uh, we're approaching seven decades now, we've been uh, at Keep America Beautiful serving as our country's steward of litter prevention. And litter matters on so many different levels. It's more than just a stain on our landscape. And I loved uh, Cheryl and David's uh, presentation because they talked about some of the ways that it impacts our lives. Uh, they talked about the impact on visitation and tourism. It really has a strong impact on our quality of life and economic development in our communities. It prevents our communities from reaching their true potential. Um, and we do know this, uh, that litter that doesn't get managed uh, eventually ends up in the natural environment and increasingly in our waterways, which I'll talk about a little bit today. So what do we do for those who aren't familiar? Uh, we work uh, not only to end littering, we also work about in, in the world of race, waste reduction and improving recycling more generally, beautifying communities and going into uh, communities after disasters. Uh, um, uh, uh, to help replant trees that are lost to disasters. So we unlock, we look to unlock the potential of every community we serve by educating the public about reducing, reusing, and recycling waste, organizing cleanups to get rid of the waste and the litter on the ground, and doing this sort of beautification that I mentioned here. And where we do it, we do it across the nation. We're truly a national movement. We have uh, um, update uh, now 700 <laughs> affiliates across the country and between partnerships and our affiliates, we're across all 50 states of the country uh, um, and we're really grounded in communities. Uh, um, and, and what that means is we partner with organizations at the community level to make the, the change in the communities. For instance, in Ohio, we have over three dozen uh, affiliates working across the state um, all over the state, northwest to southeast, uh, um, in rural, urban, and suburban uh, locations, working to do the work that we're doing also at the national level. And they do great work, and I strongly encourage you to look them up. I can't name them all, but you look up somebody like uh, Keep Akron Beautiful, and they do fantastic work uh, to really address the problems that the Ohio Litter Study and the problems that you're facing in Ohio uh, uh, um, uh, uh, are, are happening. We also work at the state level. Uh, uh, keep Cheryl mentioned Keep Ohio Beautiful. We have state affiliates across uh, in many states across the country, and they provide a key partner to state organizations like Departments of Transportation, uh, 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 
uh, tourism, uh, natural resources, parks, uh, environmental planning, and in, in economic planning. Uh, our, our state affiliates are our key partners and real subject matter experts. Um, so I was thrilled to see uh, that Ohio spoke to uh, um, some of our affiliate leaders for the study. And lastly, we work at the regional and the national level uh, as a partner in really important work. Uh, so for instance, on um, something that's very important in Ohio, we work uh, on the Great Lakes Initiative to, to really understand what it's going to take to preserve, in that case, one of our critical national uh, uh, resources. But that's enough about us. Now let me talk about the, uh, the Keep America Beautiful 2020 National Letter Study. Now, I will note, I'm going to keep on calling it the Keep America Beautiful 2020 National Litter Study, and we do that to ground uh, uh, um, at a place in time. But in fact, this, the work started in 2019 and continues today with some of the work and we, uh, that I'll, I'll talk about later. But um, we've been doing this work at Keep America Beautiful with our partners, uh, um, ERP being one of them. Uh, for many years, uh, almost since our inception in 1953. In the 50s, we started research. We did our first large national research study in 1968 and 69, which I've included a little picture of there of, you know, this is how studies looked back in the late 60s. Um, and since then, we have been engaged in uh, extensive work, both in that in landmark studies like the one I'm going to talk about today and that we did in 2009 and in 1968 and 69, but also in very subject specific and targeted research uh, studies uh, um, that really relate to uh, specific problems that you face in specific locations. Um, and the, this research uh, um, is critical to defining and designing effective programs, and in some case experiments, to, to identify what it is that we can do better to address this problem. Um, and so as I go through here today, I'm going to focus on the 2020 National Litter Study, but it's that 2020 National Litter Study is, is simply the continued work off of uh, um, 50 years worth of work prior. So how do we conduct? Uh, uh, the 2020 National Litter Study. Well, uh, um, it's a it's actually a very similar methodology to what was used uh, in Ohio. Uh, we uh, we had a project team uh, led by Birds of McDonald, uh, but also Cascadia Consulting Group, Salinas Davis Consulting, and Docking Institute for Public Affairs, all of whom who have experience. Uh, with uh, in the litter prevention space um, and lots of, uh, in some of their cases, um, uh, many decades of experience with litter prevention and litter studies. Um, and this is a, uh, uh, um, uh, just like the Ohio study, a fully professional study. So we love citizen science at Keep America Beautiful, but all of this work was conducted uh, uh, by professional engineers and environmental management consultants and academics to truly understand and define and enumerate <laughs> the problem uh, uh, so that we can get valid and reliable estimates. Um, so just like with the uh, uh, Ohio study, we did a, uh, conducted a public attitude survey, we did a visible litter survey, we're conducting a financial cost of litter uh, uh, at the present time, and we went out into the communities and we observed people littering in public places. You know, for the visible litter study, you know, how do we know how much litter is on the ground? We counted it during the pandemic uh, at over 600 randomly selected sites across the United States at both roadways and waterways. And that's a note that I, I want to emphasize here. This study provides a first national estimate of how much litter is along U.S. surface waterways. Now, we all know that there's a great deal of attention being paid these days to uh, to uh, litter and waste in our waterways. But until now, we haven't known uh, just how much that represents. And I'm going to dive into that today. There's so much more in this study than I can talk about today. Our understanding of public awareness and attitudes and behaviors about the scope and the causes and the sources of litter uh, the physical attributes of litter and uh, how they vary in different contexts, the material types uh, and features that influence when and why people litter. Uh, in, and also, uh, as I noted, we're, we're, we're still in the middle of collecting the data related to the 
public costs of litter on how those costs are distributed. Um, we're also, what's really exciting about this work is it's built on a really robust data infrastructure and methodology uh, that enables future research at scale and continuous improvement through programs. And like I mentioned before, experiments, the sorts of things that allow us to get better at this work. Um, like I mentioned, uh, I can only touch at a high level uh, uh, the you know the depth of this study. Uh, um, I face the same constraints that Cheryl and David face <laughs> in talking about Ohio. But if you want to learn more, please visit www.kab.org/literstudy. Again, that's www.kab.org slash litter study where you can uh, download uh, a summary of this study to date and uh, and learn more. Just like in Ohio, we tracked dozens and dozens of uh, product uh, litter types um, and we included both uh, what the product was and its material composition as well as its size. Uh, um, and uh, with this work, we have enabled ourselves to track uh, dynamics in uh, different uh, product litter over time from 2009 uh, to 2020. I won't get into that much today. I will highlight just a few points on that so we can understand how things are moving over time. Um, and we're also able to quantify emergent litter problems. And the one that most people recognize uh, in 2020 in the middle of the COVID pandemic was the rise of PPE litter. So enough about the methodology, let's dive into the results here uh, just a little bit more. So let's start with the question of how much litter is in America. At the time of the study, we estimate that there, are, there were 50 billion pieces of litter on the ground in America. 50 billion pieces. That is divided. We found that there were, we estimate that there were 24 billion pieces along US roadways. And this is roadways of all types from at the busiest, largest roadways, freeways and highways down to the smallest roadways in local roads using uh, um, Federal Highway Administration definitions. That represents that 24 billion uh, along roadways represents over 2,500 pieces of litter per mile along US roadways. But we also found in this first study estimating litter along road roadways that there were 20, we estimate that there were 26 billion pieces along US waterways at the time of the study. Because of the number of uh, waterway miles in the US, that equates to just over 2,400 pieces per waterway mile uh, along US surface waterways. So uh, at that point estimate, there's slightly more litter along US waterways than there are along uh, roadways. And we look, as I mentioned, we, look, we broke this down by all different types of roadways and waterways. So we know, for instance, that there's more than six times uh, more litter per mile along freeways and highways than along ro local roads. But given the fact that local roads make up the great majority of roadways in America, we estimate that half of all roadway litter is along roadways, local roads in America. Similar dynamic across waterways. There are far more littered items per mile along the largest rivers in America, but 52% of all waterway to litter is actually along intermittent waterways and streams. These sort of insights have important implications for how we direct our efforts and end litter in America. And I will note, these are national estimates. While we absolutely did sample in Ohio, this is not an Ohio study. It's a national study. So the results are going to differ somewhat between what we've heard from Cheryl and David earlier. Um, and that's not a problem in any way, shape or form. So while this problem is still massive, 50 billion pieces of litter, we actually find along roadways, which we have studied for, uh, for decades, as I've noted, from 2009 until this 2020 study, we estimate that there's been a 54% reduction in visible litter along US roadways since 2009. That's an incredible improvement. Now, for a lot of folks, uh, um, we know that people uh, uh, saw during the pandemic uh, and perceived 
uh, an increase in litter and illegal dumping uh, um, in the communities in which they live. And we have, through other data, through our community, our affiliates across the country, um, you know, we have other tools that we use, like our community appearance index, to track litter uh, in our communities on an annual basis. And the fact of the matter, when we look at that local level, is the impact of the of the pandemic actually uh, varied significantly from community to community. In some communities, central business districts in large urban areas, there was a significant decrease in litter because uh, uh, those large urban areas saw massive decreases in the people commuting to them on a daily basis. Uh, um, but in other communities where people were at home and they were out and they were recreating, we saw significant, uh, in some cases, significant increases in litter. And in particular, significant increases in illegal dumping because people were at home more, they were clearing things out more. In some cases, they no longer had access to curbside uh, recovery for short periods usually, but those short periods matter. And in some cases, they didn't have access uh, to transfer stations or drop-off areas. So we saw an increase in illegal dumping. That increase, I should note, if it existed in communities, was between, generally speaking, between 2019 and the pandemic in 2020. Now we're still living in the pandemic and we have to be uh, aware of that. But I do want to reference that since 2009, over the past decade, we have still seen along U.S. roadways nationally, we estimate a 54% decrease in litter. I want to just emphasize for a moment that what this study shows us that is if, if we only focus on roadway litter in America, we're having an incomplete picture of litter in America. And as I noted previously, 26 billion pieces of litter estimated along U.S. waterways versus 24 billion pieces of litter along U.S. roadways. But I'm going to note a little bit later that this has pretty significant implications for how the work that we need to do to prevent litter. So just like in Ohio, you know, when we ask Americans, you know, if they believe that litter is a problem, the overwhelming response was yes. Uh, just like uh, I think it was 82% of Ohioans believe uh, that uh, litter is a somewhat or a very serious problem. In Ohio, 90% uh, of Americans believe that litter is a problem in their state. They don't not only understand that it's a, a problem in their state, but they recognize that it negatively impacts the quality of life. And these are massive percentages, I should say, when I say Americans realize this. Uh, um, they recognize that it negatively impacts tourism businesses, that it eventually ends up along our waterways. It reduces property values, is an environmental problem, problem and poses a health and safety risk to people and animals. And I was thrilled to see the work that you all did in Ohio around uh, um, how the different messages affect, uh, relate to people uh, on these different problems. It's really helpful work. Now, just because 90% of Americans believe that litter is a problem doesn't mean that it's the biggest problem in their life or the biggest problem in their community. And we have to recognize, especially in, uh, uh, in the world in which we're living in today about what litter represents to people's lives. But we do know that they recognize that it's, uh, uh, that it's a problem um, so that we can talk to them about solutions. And when we talk about solutions, one of the things that we find in this study is that at 50 billion pieces of litter along US roads, it's a massive number, right? And as a, uh, a slap in the face, uh, um, it's a wow moment. But then, after the wow moment passes, it's almost unrelatable for an individual. What does 50 billion pieces mean to me and what can I do about it? And what that means when we look at it uh, from a behavioral research uh, and behavioral science pro uh, uh, perspective, uh, what we need to do is we need to reduce the distance between that problem and the lives that people lead. 50 billion is in fact too big of a problem. We need to relate it to them. And to do that, what we did is we estimated and we calculated if you took every American and uh, every resident in the US and uh, divided that into 50 billion pieces of litter, what we find out is that there's 152 pieces of litter for every single resident of the United States. So that work, 
calling this what it is. And it's 152 pieces for every single person. So at 152 in you, you can be part of the solution. We want people to understand that litter is a solvable problem and that all of us have a role to play in solving it. Now, if I convince myself that I do not litter, and as David noted <laughs> uh, in his work, uh, uh, there's a lot of people who will admit to it, and that's just the people who admit to it. Let's not talk about the fact uh, that there are many, many people who do not want to admit to the fact that they litter. Intentionally or unintentionally, it doesn't matter. It's still littering. Uh, um, but even if I convince myself that I'm not part of that problem, we want people to recognize that they're part of the solution and 152 and you is designed to do that. I know where I live that I can walk out of my front door and within a couple of hours, I can pick up 152 pieces of litter without any problem. Uh, and I will talk a little bit later about why that matters. Uh, um, not only the act of cleaning it up, but what it does for communities. But that uh, that mobilization there is to get people to recognize that they can be part of the solution. They can be part of the action. Now, we know that people acting alone, even collectively, won't eliminate litter forever. But we know through research that it actually is a critical part to creating litter free spaces. So just like in Ohio, we, too, have a list of uh, uh, litter products. And we found, just as we have found year over year, that the single most litter pro uh, product in America are cigarette butts at nearly 10 billion of that 50 billion pieces of litter. And that is a uh, uh, um, that is almost a universally held uh, conclusion at litter studies across the world. Cigarette butts are by far, and it's not even close, the single most littered product. However, I do want to note as it shows on the right hand side here, when we look at litter along roadways specifically, and we did not study waterways in 2009, we see nearly a 70% decrease in cigarette butt litter. So we're seeing a massive improvement in cigarette butt litter. And there's multiple reasons for this. One of which is a sort of work that we're talking about today. And that is that putting the work into reducing litter works. In particular, when we can get the message right for the right product, those programs are incredibly in, uh, impactful. Our cigarette litter prevention program at Keep America Beautiful, which we deploy, deploy uh, at hundreds of communities across the nation, including in some in Ohio, when we deploy that program effectively, um, when we deploy that program, pardon me, we find on average at least to a 50% reduction in cigarette litter in that space where it's deployed. Now that's a mix of starting with clean spaces, having the right infrastructure in place so that cigarette smokers can dispose of their butt properly. Because our research showed uh, uh, one of the great problems with cigarette butts is people, cigarette smokers do not want to put them in trash bins. What they want to do is put them in a cigarette butt only disposal thing because the trash bins have all sorts of dangers, including fire. Um, so you've got to get the right infrastructure, you've got to start with a clean space, and you've got to have the right message, and in this case, telling people how to dispose of their cigarette butt. But cigarette butts are still a massive problem in America, and we still have a lot of work to do. Now, I, pro uh, I do not, we do not break our, uh, uh, summarize our work into the 14 categories, but there is some overlap here. And I do want to note, for instance, that we have seen a significant increase in beer container uh, litter uh, uh, between 2009 and 2020, to the point that it's now 1.1, we estimate 1.1 billion pieces of, uh, of beer container litter on the ground across the US. But there's plenty of other problems here. And I do not want to just call that out. Uh, uh, food packaging film with snack wrappers and potato chip bags, those too are a significant problem. But there is good news along the way as some of these other things increase over the past decade. Not only are cigarette butt, the cigarette butt litter down across the U.S., fast food litter was down across the U.S., and soft drink litter, or specifically soda litter, was down across the U.S. One of the really exciting uh, um, uh, discoveries of this study um, and uh, 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 what we were enabled to do in doing this during the pandemic, uh, which, as you can imagine, was not easy. 
Uh, um, and, you know, we were certainly delayed in our work. Um, and, and we were very cautious. And as I noted before, we've taken the time to really dive into the data to understand uh, the impact of the pandemic. And I noted that earlier. But rather than the impact of the pandemic at all, I want to talk about what PPE represents. Now, on the whole, yes, we quantified how much PPE was on the ground in the U.S. And we estimate uh, at the time of the study that there were 207 millions of million pieces of PPE litter on the ground uh, um, in the U.S. But PPE represents this incredible natural experiment. It basically didn't exist as a consumer product before 2020. Yes, people were using it in the health sector, and yes, they were using it uh, uh, in food service as an example. But it wasn't part of all of our, all of our lives in the way that it uh, uh, became in 2020. It was, in essence, the introduction of a massive consumer product at a single point in time. And as such, it didn't really exist as litter before that. And then it was potentially, it had the potential to exist as litter. So it gave us the ability to understand one, how much of it uh, was getting on the ground, and two, what was happening to it when it got on the ground. Now, we all know that almost all of this was being used in our regular daily lives. We were using it at the supermarket, uh, at home, uh, at the gas station. These were the places we were using it. Where we weren't using it, by and large, uh, on the surface were on the surface waterways of the U.S. Um, so, it, if litter stayed where it was littered, we would expect almost all of that litter to be along roadways that PPE litter to be along roadways. And what we find is not that case. We found that two thirds of the PPE gloves uh, uh, litter uh, uh, on the ground were along waterways, not along roadways. And about half of the masks were uh, along waterways, not along roadways. And that's because litter moves. It does not stay in place. How does it get? from roadways to waterways? How does it get from the gas station to waterways? It gets blown around and eventually it makes it to storm drains. Now, before you may uh, 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 recollect that I had that picture of a storm drain outflow and it just the massive amounts of litter at the base of that storm drain outflow going into a stream. That is what happens to litter that does not get picked up. Now, what does that mean for the work that all of us do on this call? Uh, um, and there's a variety of people, right? This is fantastic. We've got transportation and parks and, and uh, environmental protection. Well, we know this from our study and from the work that our affiliates do, do that it doesn't, generally speaking, the litter doesn't start on waterways. It does in some cases, right? Boaters drop beer cans or fireballs off the side of their boat. That happens. They drop, you know, their accidents happen, right? You know, your, 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 your snack bag or your Ziploc bag falls off your boat. But that's not the major source of litter along waterways. Litter along waterways is getting there from roadways by and large. So when it gets to waterways, uh, cleanup becomes really, really difficult. We don't have street sweeping along waterways, along the banks of waterways, to clean up litter along the edge, the sides of waterways. And I should note that this this is what this study did, is we sampled along this the, the banks of these waterways, not in the waterways themselves. That is a different type of study. We studied along the banks. But to get those that litter out of the water and off of the banks of the water requires intense efforts. They are often difficult to access. Uh, um, often they're heavily overgrown and getting the litter off of them, uh, um, uh, you know, takes a lot of work. That is important work and we should do that work, but we should recognize that it's really about cleanup. Uh, um, I, I think it's really important from a solution perspective that entry points to waterways, we make sure that we're messaging to people getting on waterways, whether that's beaches or boat docks or, or or marinas, whatever it may be, that they you know that they know that they really need to take care of the materials there. But honestly, prevention, if we don't want litter along our waterways, we have to start on the roadways. And this is where another connection back to the work that you're talking about today here in Ohio. That litter prevention, the education, the cleanup and the 
uh, uh, creation of and the enforcement of effective laws are what will help prevent litter from getting to waterways. But if we don't do that work along our roadways and in our communities, we are in danger of it ending up along our waterways. So how can Ohio help with, um, with this problem? If you go to keepamericabeautiful.org or kab.org, you're gonna find that we talk about our model for change and our work around litter. And what is a model for change? It's about the work that you, in part that you're talking about here today. You have to start by educating people, giving them the facts that they need to have to change their behaviors. A little litter is a big problem. That campaign is a great place to start. Um, and I will note that for those of us who've been in the work for a long time, um, and I suspect as I look at the numbers of attendees, I suspect that there's a lot of folks who've been doing this work with litter for a long time. Sometimes it's exhausting <laughs> that we are still having this conversation about litter. But I would encourage you all to think about this from this perspective. Litter is a function of human life, and we continually have to do the work to educate people uh, uh, to change their behaviors and to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. We cannot do this once and have it go away. We will have new generations of people who don't know this. So the education that I received when I was a young person is not the same education that young people are receiving today. And that education matters. Ditto for the grown-ups in the room. Uh, we, are, we constantly have to educate and message to people. Uh, that they need to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. There's a few other things that really matter. Uh, um, starting with clean spaces is the first step to preventing litter, especially along those local roadways and in those parks. We know that litter, from our research, litter begets more litter. And if we want littering to stop, we need to start with clean spaces. This also connects to effective messaging. Research shows that if we have anti-littering message, messaging in heavy, heavily littered spaces, it actually has the opposite effect of what we want to have happen. People ended up in those experiments, people ended up littering more uh, um, in those spaces where there was anti-littering message and a lot of litter on the ground. The litter on the ground matters. We have to get it off the ground. So create clean spaces, then have the right infrastructure in place to prevent littering. And I loved what Cheryl had to say here. That's on every different level. It starts by having the cigarette uh, butt containers, but also the trash bins with lids on them and the recycling bins with lids on them. It also works with making sure that our haulers have the effective infrastructure in their hauling. And then when we're putting it in places that we're 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 containing it in that uh, in those spaces. That is all infrastructure, and we need that right infrastructure in place if we want to prevent litter. Uh, in that case, uh, um, unintentional litter from getting getting on the ground. We know this from littering behavior. The further somebody is in a public space uh, from a litter bin, the more likely they are to litter. Now that's just common sense, right? But we have the data <laughs> to support it. So having the infrastructure in place to help to prevent litter is important. And if you're not going to put the infrastructure in place, here's the third part, have the right message in place. So if you if you if some communities don't have litter bins, uh, if, if you're going to go that route, having the messages in place to ask people, please hold on to your waste in our national parks and in our state parks, asking people pack it out. Uh, um, those are important messages to have in place. Those messages work. Um, so that combination, starting with clean spaces, the right infrastructure, uh, the right message in the right place at the right time for the right product, and just a statewide campaign to educate people. This is the work that we need to do. And I'm thrilled to see uh, that Ohio is taking this work on today. So all of the stakeholders on this call, regardless if you're an individual who's interested in this, if you're working through your communities, if you're a Keep America Beautiful affiliate, hooray to you, we love you. 
uh, throughout the state of Ohio and in you, all these state agencies on the call, we all have a role to play in this change. And we're thrilled to see the state of Ohio uh, taking this on. Like I mentioned, uh, we all can play a role here. If you want more inf information here, just once again, uh, is the, the link to the litter study, www.kab.org slash litter study. Uh, and I'm thrilled to have been with you today. And I really appreciate the work that you're doing in the state. Now back to you, thank, Helen. Thank you, David, and to the ODOT team this morning. We've had some really great presentations. So now we're uh, going to look through and begin answering some questions that came in today from the presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane. If we don't answer your question, we will reach out to you via email following today's webinar. And we have Joel Hunt with ODOT, and I believe he's going to take most of these questions. So our first question, oh, um, so our first question is, what precipitated the study? Um, so real quick, if I could just introduce myself. So yes, my name is Joel Hunt. I work at the Ohio Department of Transportation. And um, I head up our highway beautification program. And um, I've worked with Davey and ERP and GDC on this study for a couple of years and um, managed the contract. So um, I work closely with um, our partners at uh, the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, um, certain contractors, um, all that help us with our litter abatement efforts. But we're excited to move into the realm of litter prevention because as we know from other states, it's really the most effective tool to reduce litter. So what precipitated the study? Um, so this study was an update to our 2004 litter study um, that only examines the visible litter. Um, this study that we're speaking about today looked at the behaviors and beliefs of people who litter. Um, despite all of our abatement efforts, litter continues to be a persistent and preventable problem and we wanted to examine why people letter more deeply. Okay, our next question is, what have we learned from other states regarding litter? Well, we know from other states that litter prevention and education campaigns are the most effective way to reduce litter, uh, not just on roadsides, but in neighborhoods, in parks, at tourist destinations, and remote areas where illegal dumping often occurs. So for example, in Tennessee, um, the Nobody Trashes Tennessee campaign saw a 40% reduction in roadside litter uh, after launching the campaign within the first year. And of course, the gold standard is the Don't Mess With Texas campaign that saw a 72% reduction within the first four years of its campaign launch. Um, but I have to note the programs that are most successful have a dedicated revenue stream for litter prevention. Okay, our next question is, how will we change behaviors? So this campaign aims to change behaviors through targeted messaging, focusing on respect, as David mentioned. In Ohio, the most frequent word that resonated with our survey respondents was respect. The campaign will try to solidify that and connect it to the individual's decision not to work. Okay, and one more question. How will we judge our success? One of the findings that Cheryl mentioned was um, recommendation to follow up with another study in five years to measure the visible letter and determine the behaviors and beliefs at that time to see if our messaging was successful. Um, a lot of um, measurable tools that it uses um, at the most basic level is the number of bags that we pick up. Um, all of that data is collected daily from from not just our own labor force, but also from all of our partners. Um, so we're gonna look at the trend, um, you know, 
weekly, monthly, yearly to see if we're seeing a reduction um, and correlate back to um, the efforts that we're putting forward for litter prevention. Um, and we can manage um, the campaign by looking at the data. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, ODOT team, for your great presentations and attendees for your questions. We're going to take a break now, and we have a few extra minutes. We ended a little bit early, so you can go grab an extra cup of coffee and come back at 1025. We will uh, start promptly again then. Our next summit session is Litter in Ohio State Parks. First up, we have the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Director, Mary Mertz. Governor Mike DeWine appointed Director Mertz in January of 2019. In this role, Mertz leads and oversees 11 divisions that manage Ohio State Parks, preserves, and forests. They also analyze and report on geologic and water resources, protect and improve the Lake Erie coastline, conserve and manage Ohio's fish and wildlife, and regulate oil, gas, and mining industries. A lawyer with experience in both the public and private sectors, Mertz served as first attorney general during Mike DeWine's entire tenure in the Ohio Attorney General's office. She has served in many other government posts as well. Mertz earned her undergraduate degree at American University, a master's degree at George Washington University, and her Juris Doctorate at the Ohio State Moritz College of Law. In her free time, she enjoys sailing, hiking, and exploring Ohio's great outdoors. I'd like to turn over the mic to Director Mertz. Thanks so much. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to join you all today and, and, and talk about um, a big problem facing us, and that's the, the litter we're finding over Ohio's landscape. So why don't you advance the slide? Thank you, and advance the slide one more time. So at ODNR, we are in the business of getting people to explore and love Ohio's great outdoors. We wanna make sure that every trip Ohio citizens make to one of Ohio's state parks, forests, wildlife areas, and nature preserves is both beautiful and safe. Our staff and hundreds of volunteers across the state work year round to keep all of our public properties clean and well maintained. These pictures you see in front of us, these are experiences we want everyone to have in the pristine natural world. Next slide, please. But over the last year and a half, if you could advance that slide. But yeah, over the last year and a half, that task has gotten a whole lot harder with limited indoor options and families looking for safe entertainment. Our outdoor spaces have been very, very busy. So last year alone, our state parks hosted more than 1,035,000 overnight bookings. And that was 120,000 more than the year before. So you can just see this is exponential increases in usage. But we always wanna make people feel welcome in the outdoors. But all of these visitors, many of them unfamiliar with the norms of our properties and the need to leave no trace behind, have led to a significant increase in the amount of litter that's left behind. And this isn't a problem we take lightly. Next slide, please. So we've worked to attack this litter problem through a combination of strategies. First, some increased litter-related communication, signage, staffing, more volunteer opportunities. So getting out there and addressing the issue head on. Uh, second, we have been putting into place a system-wide sustainability initiative. And you're gonna hear about both of these things from some, um, some of my team in a few minutes. And, and finally, we've had a more focused enforcement effort by our natural resource officers and our wildlife officers. So we've, we've worked hard to put together a strategy to, to deal with the unprecedented litter we've seen over this last year. Um, next slide, please. If you follow us on social media, you know that typically ODNR and the Ohio State Park social media accounts are where we share these 
beautiful, stunning pictures to inspire people to get out and explore. But with the litter situation being what it's been, we started posting pictures of the mess. And the good news is people aren't happy about it. These posts received just passionate responses from our followers. Each one received hundreds of shares, reactions, and comments. I mean, no one wants to go out and see see the kind of mess you see on these um, posts, greet them. You wanna go out and enjoy, enjoy Ohio's beauty, not this mess. And so um, the next slide is going to show you one of the videos we shared recently on our social media to try to get people's attention and talk about what they can do. So next slide, uh, please, and, and a video. Ohio's natural beauty belongs to all of us. Public land is your land. And it's worth protecting. Litter ruins habitat. It hurts our wildlife. It spoils the scenery. Garbage belongs in a can. Not in our parks our forests, our lakes, our streams. When you visit, don't leave a mess. If you bring it in, take it out. Pack your picnic with reusable containers, utensils, and tableware. Avoid products with excessive packaging. And don't forget to bring along a trash bag. If a trash can is available, use it. But if it's full, don't add to the mess. Plan ahead so you can leave our places even better than you found them. Bring a grocery bag from home. Flip it inside out over your hand and use it to pick up any litter you may see. Throw it in your pack and take it out with you. When someone litters on public land, they're littering on your land. It may seem like just a little litter, but it's really a big problem. And so our goal with that video was to both educate and provide guidance. We wanted to help people know what they should do and what they should not do as they plan for a day in Ohio's great and beautiful outdoors. On this slide, you see um, some of our, our, our signage that we've put out in locations where we see the most litter. We created specific signs for trailheads, for beaches and for picnic areas. And those are, those are sort of pain points, reminding people to not overfill available trash containers and to carry out any waste they carry in. And, and these signs um, complement our, our online messaging. So um, we, they, they've been out there and we're, we hope they're making a difference. So next slide, please. So litter is unsightly. When you go out into nature, you're trying to escape the effect of everyday life, right? You, and, you know, and litter really distracts you from that. But it also can be dangerous and unpleasant for visitors who could be cut on broken glass or rusty cans. It builds up and can clog, clog some of our drainage areas. It's attractive and dangerous to our wildlife. Um, Everyone's familiar with the six pack rings that can get caught on birds and fish, but there's so many other types of litter, of litter that are also damaging to important wildlife across our state. And so sometimes we have to take a heavier hand when it comes to dealing with this problem. Next slide, please. So while working on routine patrol, littering is an offense that officers do enforce in our parks and wildlife areas. We surveil areas to catch illegal dumpers and when warranted, actively investigate dumping on our properties. Individuals can face fines and punishment for dumping trash into waterways, even on their own property, because while a creek might run through your backyard, it, it, it carries it down and the state is responsible for managing those waterways. Even a small violation can cost individuals hundreds of dollars in fines more significant dumping could even land you in jail. And so the way to contact us, if you do see the litter, you can dial pound ODNR, or you can dial 1-800-POACHER. Uh, they both take, th these are both direct lines to our 24 seven dispatch center at ODNR. You can report these little litter violations and, and we can follow up with an investigation. It's helpful when we have a description of the littering incident, the location, and any leads or clues you might have to help us track down the individual later, but we do take it very seriously. Next slide, please. So 
Ohio's public lands belong to everyone. And we believe we need to help everyone understand that litter isn't someone else's problem. It's everyone's problem. It's choking our streams, our landscapes, and our wildlife. And so we all need to do our part to keep our public spaces clean. So cleaning up what you see on this slide will continue to be a priority for our team, cleaning it up and preventing it. I mean, our, our state simply deserves better. So I, um, I appreciate your, your time and listening to that. And I know a couple of the ODNR team members now are gonna share some specific examples and things we're working on. Uh, and I believe Josh Gardner, uh, one of our park district managers is, is gonna speak up next, but I'll, I'll turn the mic back over for his introduction. Thank you, Director Mertz. Next up, we have Josh Gardner with ODNR. Mr. Gardner is a 20 year veteran of Ohio State Parks and Watercraft. He currently serves in the role of central district manager overseeing the operations of nine state parks in the central Ohio area. Prior to his current role of district manager, he served as the park manager for Mohican State Park. Josh began his career as a park officer at Deer Creek State Park. I'd now like to turn the mic over to Josh. Thank you. Okay, I think we're having a, a technical glitch here. Um, Josh, can you try again? Um, it's it's coming through a little bit garbled. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, that's much better. Okay, I apologize for that. Oh, that's okay. Technology is great when it works perfectly. <laughs> All right. Just have to have to give it another try. Okay. Again, good morning. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to share with you today about our Nat Department of Natural Resources Environment and Sustainability Initiative, litter prevention and mitigation, you know, which is part of our larger goal to reduce waste and energy consumption. We obviously take environmental sustainability seriously because of the implications it has for the health and safety of all Ohioans now and in the future. As a district manager for the Division of Parks and Watercraft, I oversee nine parks and support six park managers in their effort to fulfill our mission, which is to preserve Ohio's natural and cultural resources while providing public recreation and educational opportunities. Our sustainability efforts, efforts help us achieve the delicate balance of preserving resources while also providing broad public access to them. As with all of our environmental sustainability initiatives, we look at both internally at our site management practices and externally at our visitor behaviors, motivations, and levels of understanding when devising ways to reach our ultimate goal, which is to be here for Ohioans into the future, offering beautiful natural spaces for the recreational enjoyment. Next slide, please. Litter is not a new problem in state parks. We manage very popular resources for public enjoyment. But since the pandemic, our parks have experienced record numbers of visitors. So it's not surprising that with this increase in people, we've experienced an uptick in litter. Most of the litter we see see seems to be the result of food and drink consumption and our modern way of life puts a high priority on convenience. Packaging and disposability like single use water bottles, plates and cups all add to the ever increasing amount of trash that can become litter. For us, we view litter as trash or solid waste that's out of place, not in a receptacle. Next please. Litter obviously sends a message. We can see it in our picnic areas, our campgrounds, our trails, playgrounds, and beaches. Wherever our customers go, and even places they don't go, we can find litter. An area that is litter can send the wrong message that litter is acceptable. A park is not like going to a baseball game or maybe a movie theater where it might be okay to leave trash behind. Trash left behind in a park will become litter 
which can travel by wind, water, and other means taking places beyond where it was dropped. So it's important that we send the message that litter is never acceptable in a park. Next, please. The presence of litter in a park is unsightly and takes away from the natural beauty that park visitors come to enjoy. But not only is it ugly, it also increases the risk of injury or other dangerous conditions for people, for wildlife, and for the health of the water resources that all people, all living things depend on. Next, please. So our approach to combat litter is two-pronged, prevention and mitigation. To deter littering or prevention, we promote a statewide carry-in, carry-out practice for trash. By instituting this practice, we want to underscore a guiding principle that we share with many others who manage parks and public recreation areas. Leave a place as clean or cleaner than you found it. You likely heard the saying, take only pictures, leave only footprints. This sentiment supports that same notion. We'd like our carry-in carry-out practice to promote a heightened awareness among visitors of the quantity and type of waste they generate. Our hope is that awareness leads to changes in the way Ohioans pack for a picnic or a day at the park. Carry-in carry-out also has a financial benefit. It saves our taxpayers money in disposal fees and in the purchase of emptying, maintenance, and replacement of receptacles. The second practice we have designed to prevent litter is reminders in the forms of strategically placed signs in every park reminding visitors of the impact and litter of litter in parks. This campaign, A Little Litter is a Big Problem, is based on the assumption that park visitors don't like a littered park and can be encouraged to properly dispose of their waste so they aren't contributing to the problem. The campaign aims to compel individual action on the basis that even one piece of litter, one bottle, can contribute to the bigger problem. Next, please. So how do we address the litter that we do have? Well, in general, in parks, the more an area is used, the more it must be managed to limit impact to the resource. While we strongly encourage the carry-in, carry-out practice, it is necessary in high-use areas to provide trash receptacles and other mitigation efforts. At 3,000 feet long, the Allen Creek State Park Beach is the largest inland beach in Ohio State Parks. And due to its proximity to Columbus and natural beauty, it has always been one of the most heavily used areas in Ohio State Parks. And this visitation increased significantly during the pan pandemic. Visitors to our beach, to the Allen Beach, often spend an entire day enjoying time with friends and family and having large picnics, picnics that can produce high volumes in, of trash. So it is imperative that we properly manage this area through staffing and providing the appropriate amount of trash receptacles. So this year, in response to the increased usage and litter problems at Allen Creek Beach, we hired three staff members as beach attendants, beach attendants whose time is dedicated solely to the beach with the primary focus of keeping the area clean and mitigating litter through emptying trash cans, handing out trash bags to large groups and picking up litter. The work and presence of beach attendants has drastically reduced the overall amount of litter, the overflowing trash cans, and they have promote, helped promote the desired outcome of a litter-free beach. Studies have shown that people are less likely to litter in an area that is litter-free than one that is littered. So by taking it Enhanced efforts at preventing and mitigating litter, visitors begin to recognize that a litter-free beach is a normal condition, and in turn, they help to keep it that way. The second big change we made was posting our closing hours on a large message board and clearing the beach and closing gates at 9 p.m. Our natural resources officers have been invaluable in making this happen, and it has also helped reduce the litter and unwelcome behaviors that can occur after hours. As previously stated by Director Mertz, our officers have also taken a renewed focus on litter enforcement at the beach and other areas around our park. We're also very lucky to have the support of park lovers too in our battle with litter. Park, our park naturalists coordinates with public and special interest groups to help with one-time cleanups or on a periodic basis. We also partner with other agencies such as Keep Delaware County Beautiful to help combat the litter problem. Next, please. So moving forward, our focus will be to further educate the public on preventing litter in our parks, promoting responsible visitor behavior, and exploring ways to reduce the overall amount of trash generated in our state parks. One such way is to replace the current commingled waste receptacles with waste sorting receptacles to see how that impacts litter and waste disposal costs. 
because our park locations are all over the state, there are varying sizes, have a wide variety of facilities and natural features, and varying numbers of visitors, it's difficult to find a one size fits all solution to our challenges. As with other management practices, we'll be able to apply what we've learned at Allen Creek to other facilities, but each park is unique. So we rely on those who are most familiar with our parks, the park managers to test and revise our methods as needed to find a solution that will work best for them. Next, please. We manage 75 parks with more than 175,000 acres and over a thousand miles of shoreline. Right now, between permanent and seasonal employees, we have over 1,200 people working for 11.8 million Ohioans. If we are to fulfill our mission, our commitment to Ohioans must be sustained. Litter prevention is just one aspect of our sustainability plan, but it's very important one because it has the power to impact the health and the ecosystems on which we rely for our health and well being. If you love Ohio State Parks, help us spread the word. Today, tell someone why litter is a problem in Ohio State Parks and encourage them to carry in and carry out their waste. And remember that litter is no little thing. Thank you. Thank I believe you, Josh. Now, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, thank you so much, Josh. Um, next, we have Susan Vance with ODNR. Ms. Vance has worked for ODNR's Division of Parks and Watercraft and Division of Wildlife. She currently serves as the Assistant Chief over Field Operations for the Division of Parks and Watercraft. She's a lifelong Ohioan, graduate of The Ohio State University, and currently resides in Columbus, Ohio. I'd now like to turn the mic over to Susie Vance. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited to be here talking with you today about our sustainability efforts at the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. So sustainability encompasses such a vast array of concepts, ideas, and practices. And while each of those things are incredibly important for all the work we do at DNR, I'm gonna focus my time with you today on sustainable products that we're starting to use in some of our Ohio State Parks. So I'll take the next slide, please. It's our, or it's our mission at ODNR to ensure a balance between wise use and protection of our natural resources for the benefit of all. It's a great mantra, right? I, I love it and, and we try to um, just make sure that we are, we are living by that mission every day. Uh, and then within the Parks and Watercraft Division, our vision is to provide exceptional outdoor recreation and boating opportunities through our customer service, our education, protection, and conservation of parks and waterways. So we have this overarching mission of our department and then our vision within our division is really focused more on the visitor experience and, and outdoor recreation. We know that the actions we take when we manage this recreation and when we manage our state parks and waterways, it has a profound impact on how people interact with recreation. So with the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about our impact. Um, as you know by now, <laughs> with our previous presenters, we have 75 state parks across the state. Um, within those locations, we have dozens of stores, retail locations, and food service operations. And you've heard about the increased number of visitors that we've seen in recent years. So each one of our park locations and then each one of our retail locations and restaurants serve thousands and thousands of customers. So, we want to reduce the amount of trash, right? That's our overall goal. But there, are, there, are, there is the reality that, that we're, we're a ways away from eliminating trash completely. So when people come to some of our locations, they want and do need to buy and use some disposable items. So we know that the change we make and we can make um, immediately is in the type of items that we offer for sale and for use in our restaurants and in our retail locations, like our camp stores and our marinas. So next slide, please. And I'll talk a little bit more about our changes that we're making. We are working really hard to reduce single use items that we sell in our camp stores. And where we need to offer single use items, we try to offer more sustainable options. 
uh, we're working with our partners that run our state park lodges. Uh, we have partners that run some of and operate some of our marinas, and we have other park property operations, and we want them to implement some of the same changes, even though they are private industry. Um, we want them to reflect the mission and the vision of ODNR and of parks and watercraft. So our goal is to expand our sustainability efforts, not just to products used, but ultimately we want to expand our energy and water or the, the um, sustainability of our energy and water use, um, the sustainability in our building plant plans as we upgrade our facilities. And we even want to be more sustainable in the grounds plans um, that we implement as we consider the best use of recreational areas. But again, these are kind of next steps and, and I do want to share with you in the next slide um, some of our purchasing efforts in our camp stores. So within our division, we have hundreds of employees with purchasing authority. Um, dozens of these employees make decisions every single day about the products that we offer for use in our commissaries and for sale in our camp stores, in our marinas, and our other retail locations. So we've provided these employees and these individuals some key questions to ask themselves each time they make a purchase. We want them to think about where this product end, ends its life. Does it break down? How long will that take? Can this item be recycled? Is it made of recycled materials? And does this product reduce waste? We know each product isn't going to be perfect, but we're certainly making strides for better options with each of the items we provide. So. In the next slide, I've got some examples of those kind of swaps that we've made. Um, some statewide moves we've made include removing styrofoam from our inventory of purchased items. So we found this great option for coolers from Igloo. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen or used any. Um, they're sturdy paper, they last for several uses, so and they're biodegradable. So um, they're kind of a great option for the older styrofoam igloo cooler that you could buy that was, I'll say it's disposable, but um, certainly not sustainable. Um, we're using paper or recycled cups instead of styrofoam cups in our stores for coffee um, or soft drinks, uh, paper straws. We're selling reusable um, either metal or silicone straws in our camp stores and then offering wooden stir sticks for coffee instead of the traditional plastic swizzle sticks that you used to see. Uh, where we used to sell saran wrap, uh, we're starting to offer beeswax wrap, uh, reusable sandwich bags, or just plain tin foil that can certainly be recycled. If you opt for a bowl of ice cream at one of our camp stores, you're going to find a more sustainable spoon instead of a one-time use plastic spoon. We've got some different options of spoons to use in our um, uh, camp stores for a scoop of ice cream. And if you make a purchase of a t-shirt or another souvenir, we're going to bag it up for you in a compostable or a paper bag. And there are lots of other new and, and exciting sustainable products um, in stores or, or in the works. And, and I would invite you to visit some of our camp stores the next time you're out camping with us at one of our state parks. So what's next? These are great steps, right? So on the next slide, where do we go from here? I talked a little bit about uh, sustainability's broad reach, and we really are working to implement broader sustainable measures. A silver lining of COVID, there are a few, um, is that we are well on our way to installing, you know, uh, touch-free faucets and touch-free fixtures. And while these help with the spread of germs, they do also really help with reducing water use and reducing paper product use. We have in process some electric vehicle charging stations at two of our state parks, Houston Woods and Caesar Creek. And our hope there is that electric vehicle drivers, um, we know that there's that ever present tether and we wanna expand that for our EV drivers. So we're taking advantage of technology too. We're installing sensors in some of our trash receptacles that actually notify us when a dump dumpster is full and needs picked up. It also records peak times 
um, of, of use of when, when the dumpster is getting full up, when the trash is getting full, to better address our needs and reduce overflow. So that's kind of an exciting new um, technological uh, uh, idea that's in place at Ohio State Parks. Um, and I will never miss, miss a chance to promote our new Detour app. So this is an app um, that contains trails all across Ohio. You can download this, Detour Ohio, and we hope that by having a, an electronic version of our maps, um, there's some potential to reduce the amount of carelessly discarded paper maps that we have found along trails. We're working to incorporate recycling options into many of our state parks. And then last but not least, we're working to feature more local partners wherever possible to promote local sourcing. So I, I believe I have an ending slide. I, I might not. Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate um, Director Mertz's challenge to our division and our employees to improve sustainability in all of our efforts. And I want to offer a, a special shout out to Deborah Hawkbein, Laura White, Heidi Whitman, and all of our purchasers that are taking this challenge really seriously and implementing changes throughout our state park system. And I hope you all are as excited about these changes as we are. I appreciate your time and the opportunity to talk with you today about our efforts to improve sustainability in Ohio state parks. Thank you all. Thank you, Susie, and thank you, OD and our team. We're now going to begin answering questions submitted during the presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane. If we don't get to your question during the Q&A portion, we will reach out to you via email following today's summit. Okay, our first question is, what are visitors supposed to do with their trash if there aren't trash cans at parks? And Josh, would you like to field this one? Yes, yeah, so if there's not a trash can available, our, our, it's that notion of carry in, carry out. Uh, take it home, uh, dispose of it at home. Okay, hey, how can groups and organizations help with litter pickups at state parks? Josh, do you want to take that one as well? Yeah, I, the best thing is to contact your local park and they'll put you in touch with the park manager, maybe a park naturalist who would be happy to organize something with you. And that's something we do on a very regular basis. Hey, I have witnessed people actively littering at a park. What's the best course of action when that happens? Um, Josh? Yeah, so we certainly want you to be safe. So, you know, if you see someone doing that, uh, we don't want you to approach them. Um, you know, but what you can do, um, gather as much information as you can safely, right? Possibly vehicle information, license plate if possible, a description. And then call Pound ODNR, um, you know, and our dispatch will work to locate the closest officer and pass that information on to him and, and follow up and hopefully, uh, you know, catch the uh, perpetrators. Okay, we have a sustainability question here. Um, what, what can I do to have a more sustainable visit to a park? Uh, Susie, can you take that one? Of course. Um, so I, I guess I think of this uh, kind of like I think about packing my lunch, right? So if you're having, uh, if, if you're planning a visit, and it does take a little bit more planning, um, plan a picnic using reusable containers, um, bring things back home with you, especially if, if you're carrying things in and you have the chance to um, make sure to fill that reusable water bottle before you before you hit the trail and that way you can keep filling it whenever the water um whenever there's water available and that keeps you from obviously having to to purchase uh, uh bottled water or bottled drinks um there's there's always or there there may be that need but the steps that you take to plan before your trip can really have a big impact on bringing sustainable items with you and, and taking them back home um, and preparing them for use over and over again. Okay, and we'll wrap this session up with one last question here. Uh, recycling isn't available at my local park, but I wanna recycle, so what should I do? Uh, Susie, would you like to take that one? I, I would, thank you. So. 
You know, this is this is a struggle, um, and and we do recognize, and we're working to increase um, the the options for recycling. If there's not recycling at a park location, um, we are challenging our park. Uh, staff to know where the nearest recycling location is. Um, and then there's always the option. Again, it, it's it's a little bit more effort. Um, I personally find it really kind of worthwhile to, to bring things back home or um, uh, carry things out, drive them uh, uh, maybe on your way home. There's a, there's a recycling facility um, or someplace nearby, or you can put them in your own uh, recycling uh, 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 options at the house. So we do really encourage that while at the same time, we again are, are really working to increase our recycling options at our state parks. Okay, great, thank you so much. Thank you, ODNR team, for your great presentations and your attendee, and the attendees had some great questions. I know we ran over a few minutes, but I wanted to get all the questions in. Our next session highlights litter in Ohio's lakes, rivers, and streams, summarizes the Recycling and Litter Prevention Grant Program, and features litter prevention success stories. Our first presenter is Ohio EPA Director Lori Stevenson. In January 2019, Governor Mike DeWine appointed Lori Stevenson as Director of the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. Prior to her appointment, Director Stevenson served as Deputy Director for Business Relations, helping regulated entities coordinate permitting activities within the agency. She also served as chief of Ohio EPA's Division of Environmental and Financial Assistance, which provides financial and technical assistance to businesses and communities to help achieve compliance with the environmental regulations. She also managed Ohio EPA's Small Business Assistance Office and has also helped to help positions in the Division of Hazardous Waste Management, starting, with the South, starting in the Southeast District Office as a hazardous waste field inspector. A public servant of 30 years, Lori earned a bachelor's degree in environmental health from Bowling Green State University and a master's in public health from The Ohio State University. I'd like to turn over the mic to Director Stevenson. Great, well, thank you, Helen, for that introduction. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and spend a little time uh, talking with everyone about you know, Ohio EPA's role in the world of waste management litter prevention. So next slide, please. You know, before I do that, though, I, I, I would like to take a, a minute or two and just to, to provide some thank yous to, to several people. You know, first and foremost, to the governor for his leadership commitment um, and his recognition that, you know, littering is a statewide priority and focus area that really requires collaboration and partnership between agencies. So it's really an exciting time, although we have, you know, challenges in front of us, it's really an exciting time to be working in such a creative, collaborative way with, with other agencies. So I also just wanted to quickly thank Director March Banks and Director Mertz for their leadership first and foremost in partnership and for the commitment of their entire teams. Um, not only what you're doing independently within your organizations, what your teams are doing, but your commitment to work with our agency in partnership. It's just, uh, it's been great. I think we've made a tremendous amount of progress um, so far, but we know there's a lot of work ahead of us. So I just wanted to thank you, your teams, uh, for all of your efforts. I want to thank my team quickly. Many of many of uh, my teammates are here listening in, uh, but also devote uh, their day-to-day -day responsibilities in the world of waste management, alternative, sustainable practice, uh, focus, and litter prevention. And so I know I have um, people on deck and listening in who have devoted their entire careers to helping to make a difference. And I want to thank all of you. Uh, and really want to thank the entire team across the board and all agencies for organizing today's event. I, I have been listening in for quite a while and it's I've learned a lot. Uh, I've jotted down a lot of notes and I'm really energized by what I'm hearing. Um, 
and the and the commitment, you know, is really compelling. And it's not just between our agencies or among our agencies. It is all of the partners who uh, also work outside of our agencies and organizations, individuals and communities, um, focused on this important issue that does affect us all, as Director Mertz said. It's it's a collective effort. It's a collective responsibility. And it's a collective vision that we all have um, to really improve things for uh, the benefit of people, the benefit of our natural resources, uh, and to really set us up for a more successful future. So, you know, the first couple of pictures here, you know, that's that's what we desire to see when we step out, you know, out of our offices and into nature. And as we saw in all of the very compelling visuals from ODNR, that unfortunately uh, is not the state of things uh, as we step out and try and enjoy our natural resources. So um, I think those visuals were very compelling. This is what we desire to see, um, but we know that's not the reality in a lot of places that we go that we go to. Um, there were several things that I just, that really resonate me with me from, from some of the previous speakers. And um, as I, you know, go through my remarks, um, it just strikes me. And I think it was Dr. Scott who, who said, um, it's difficult to believe that we're still having this conversation about litter. And I wrote that down. I think I've said that phrase on multiple occasions, um, but we are still having the conversation and I think it lends itself to um, just kind of the complexity of the issue. What seems to be um, somewhat of a simple matter uh, really isn't. And it requires just a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach from um, top down to bottom up by a lot of partners across the board um, to really make a difference. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus a little bit of time today in talking about Ohio EPA's role as it relates to supporting uh, litter prevention efforts across the state. So next slide, please. You know, I think a lot of people are very familiar with the agency's regulatory role and responsibility as it relates to, you know, helping to ensure proper management of solid waste. So again, we have a full team uh, devoted every day to, to the regulatory oversight and ensuring that we have um, proper outlets for good waste management practices. And we also have a very large team of people who work in the world of sustainability and alternatives um, to waste management. And so I won't I won't do a deep dive in, into that area, but just to say that we have people day in and day out who, who have their eye uh, on proper waste management alternatives uh, and sustainable practices. And again, I, I so much appreciate and value the work that they do for the benefit of all of us. What we have done for many years and what we have a long history of, of doing is um, also supporting efforts across the board from an education outreach, um, funding perspective, supporting communities, organizations who are also invested in um, making a difference in reducing litter. And so through our long history of our recycling and litter prevention grant program, um, we've supported communities, other organizations uh, in many, many ways. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the focus areas that we look at under our grant program, some of the things that we support. You know, if you're listening in and you have a project, you have an idea, you have something that you're trying to launch within your community, I would encourage you to follow up and talk with our team and take advantage of um, potential funding and resources uh, and our team of experts who can help you kind of get where you want to go. So within the program, we support litter prevention uh, in communities in, in a number of different ways. And so I'll quickly go through the next couple of slides. We, we devote funding to support communities that need to purchase equipment, materials, supplies, uh, and other resources to support their ongoing litter collection efforts. Uh, we do a lot of work in the world of tire collection um, tire tire disposal is a growing growing issue. It's been around, but it seems to be on the uptick. So we support a lot of communities in their efforts to address scrap tires through amnesty collection events, um, surveillance efforts, and other things that they do to try and prevent the disposal of scrap tires. 
We also support communities and other organizations in their efforts to create and update uh, litter prevention education and training materials. I think it was a previous speaker that, you know, it, it really all starts with education and outreach, uh, compelling messaging as we're talking about later today. Uh, so we support those efforts um, with communities and, and other entities. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we also help on the surveillance end, and Director Mertz talked about, you know, o ODNR surveillance efforts at parks. We we also support um, local law enforcement who have a presence out there in their communities to try and um, create disincentives through surveillance for for littering activity. So helping them with um, things like surveillance cameras. Um, is helpful in their efforts to try and create some, some deterrence uh, in certain areas where they know that littering or waste disposal might be a problem for them. So supporting law enforcement in those efforts, also supporting education and outreach opportunities, as I mentioned, through litter prevention conferences, and also helping the many, many communities that have been part of the really important uh, Keep America Beautiful Network for many, many years. So helping them with certifications, renewal fees, so they can stay connected uh, to that network uh, in support of their ongoing efforts to host litter collection events, um, other things that are related to uh, the goals and objectives under Keep America Beautiful. So, you know, that's just a quick list of some of the types of activities and projects that we have supported over many years. Um, since 2010, as you can see here on the slide, we have funded and supported more than 500 projects, totaling more than $4.6 million related to litter prevention and cleanup. So a uh, fairly substantial investment in communities to support a lot of projects. Um, but as we've heard from previous speakers, um, there is a lot of additional work to be done on all fronts. So, you know, our commitment is to continue our investment, to continue our support uh, through our grant programs to support as many projects as we can. Next slide, please. I just asked the team as they were preparing my talking points is just to provide everyone with a quick snapshot of, you know, what are the outcomes of the dollars that we are investing in some of these activities. So I appreciate the team just pulling together a quick snapshot of 20. This is just 2018 as an example. Um, in 2018, our dollars went to support 177 cleanup activities, 170 miles of shoreline cleaned up. Um, over 2,600 miles of roadside litter picked up and almost 12,000 bags of litter collected. So while those numbers um, definitely are impressive, I can't help but think back to, I think it was again, Dr. Scott's um, comments about the fact that we have 50 billion pieces um, of litter out there um, waiting, <laughs> waiting to be addressed. So, you know, we continue to move forward. Um, one project at a time, working with all of our partners to make as much of a difference as we can, but we know that it is a it is a sustained effort that we need to. So we need a long game uh, on this. And so we will continue to do our part to support to support our partners. Um, next slide, please. You know, I talked about, and again, I, I want to thank all of our partners who are joining us. It is, it's not just about what our agencies are doing. Uh, it's about what we are all doing. And there are many, many partners that have had a very long, rich history in supporting uh, litter prevention activities, educational activities, outreach activities. And so, as I said earlier, you need kind of the top down, bottom up, you need to approach it from all angles. And so I am very happy um, to shortly turn it over to Linda Beck, who is representing um, keep Euclid beautiful. And I think it's, uh, I'm very excited to hear more about just a very successful localized effort to make a difference uh, in her community. And so with that, Helen, I guess I turn it back over to you to do a quick intro of Linda. But thank you everyone for, for your time today. Thank you, Director Stevenson.
And now we do have Linda Beck uh, with the City of Euclid. Linda is Executive Director for Keep Euclid Beautiful. Ms. Beck has worked for the City of Euclid for 14 years and has been serving in her current role of Secretary to the Mayor's Office and the Director of Keep Euclid Beautiful for Ohio year, oh, for five years. Linda completed training and became a certified Keep America Beautiful Executive Director in 2017. She was instrumental in forming Keep Euclid Beautiful. She completed her Master Recycling Certification in 2020 with the Cuyahoga County Solid Waste District and is a waste in place trainer for Keep America Beautiful. She is also a proud lifelong resident of Northeast Ohio. And now I'd like to pass the mic to Linda. Uh, thank you very much um, for having me. This is, I'm really excited to share the information on who we are and what we're doing in Northeast Ohio. And um, am I advancing my own slides? Yes, Linda, you have keyboard and mouse control. Okay, thank you. Oops. Oh. I apologize, it doesn't seem to be advancing. Um, you just need to click on the slide, then your arrow oh. keys or your mouse will work. Oh, thank you. Okay, so um, sorry about that. So uh, who we are, we're Keep Euclid Beautiful. We're an affiliate of Keep America Beautiful. And uh, Euclid is a suburb of Cleveland on Lake Erie. We have a population of a little over 48,000 and we're 10 square miles. And we are lucky enough to have 12 city parks within our beautiful city here on the lake. So our mission statement that we had come up with when we formed Keep Euclid Beautiful is all about litter collection and prevention, recycling and education, and beautification. So our main goal is to empower residents and volunteers and put tools and supplies right in their hands to make their own community beautiful. So it's a real grassroots effort. Uh, today I'll be focusing on our litter and recycling activity and the impact on our parks, beaches, and waterways, um, especially uh, all of our funding and things we get through Ohio EPA's recycling and litter prevention grant. So Euclid Creek, uh, Euclid is part of Euclid Creek Reservation. We have seven water, we have seven wetlands, we have a watershed, and Euclid Creek runs right through the city and filters down into Lake Erie. We are fortunate enough to have five miles of shoreline along Lake Erie. So we're really in a unique position where we've got the best of both worlds here. Um, our beach has both private and public access. And this is a shot of our beautiful beach along Sims Park, one of our larger parks in the city of Euclid. Within this park, Sims Park, we also have our Euclid Waterfront Trail. Sims Park is a 30 acre park along the lakefront. It has a beach, a fishing pier, and most recently a one mile walking trail. It's going to soon have paddlecraft beaches and it really is giving unprecedented access to the lakefront on the east side. So this is an amazing natural resource to have, but one of the problems we found out that comes with it is more visitors bring more litter. So we weren't sure you know, how we were gonna handle that. So we did some research and we applied for the Ohio EPA grant and we became a Keep America Beautiful affiliate. And so we formed a team, this is the uh, team there where we performed uh, all the training, conducted a litter survey. It took about nine months from a very dedicated team of nine people plus myself. And now we're uh, Amer Keep America Beautiful affiliate. So we went to work. One of the things we started was the big clean. 
And this is Keep Euclid Beautiful's signature event. Every spring on Earth Day, Euclid engages in a friendly competition with our neighboring cities of Collinwood, Cleveland, Wycliffe, and Willowick, and to see who can pick up the most litter in one day. And it's a very friendly competition, but yet, you know, Euclid has won it most years. We don't know if we're proud that means we have more litter or if it means we're just doing a great job picking it up. And afterwards, we have a big celebration. This is our version of the Great American Cleanup. It usually garners at least 300, no less than 300 volunteers to just spring clean our cities and set the tone for the year. And it's just to work on keeping the litter out of from washing down storm drains and into the lake. This is one of the banners. The event is funded with our recycling and litter prevention grant from the Ohio EPA. We use the litter grant funding to purchase banners and supplies. These banners are hung all over the city to alert people of the date of the big clean and how to register. It's so popular now after four years that we have most groups and people calling us ahead of time saying, can I get the big clean on my schedule? When is that happening? So that's quite wonderful. Oops, I went one too far. During these events, this is a shot from our this year's Big Clean. This is the National Honor Society. All of our local schools and high schools, when they have um, students that need service hours, they come to us. And we try to involve as many families and youth as possible in this event. And just to let them know how important this is for the future of the community. And most of these kids, once they pick up litter, they swear they're never gonna litter again. And you can see the safety vest that everyone has to wear and we're able to provide trash bags and grabbers, all supplies we buy with our grant money. Another thing we do during the big clean is we do drain stenciling. We aim to do 10 to 15 drains every year that we do this event. Our focus is always around schools or parks or frequent pedestrian areas like our downtown area. We're always trying to remind people that the litter washes down the storm drains and into the lake. And it's really important to try and prevent that from happening. A lot of kids going to school, they're always curious and, and looking for things. So that's, that's a really nice component for them to see that on their walk to school. And that is all done by volunteers. Uh, we also attend our community events. We have a couple large scale community events. This one is from our East 200 Street Stroll. And we have a real fun game called Lasting Litter that people like to play. And it's very popular where you try to match up six pieces of trash with how long they will sit in a landfill and why it's better to recycle it. If you're able to mat correctly match up all six, we give away one of our t-shirts You'll see there in the background, one of our specialized t-shirts for the big clean and um, some other merchandise that we purchase with our grant funds. And it really, it's it's a lot harder than people think. It really makes people think and they, they really leave that game or table from, you know, thinking that, wow, this stuff really stays in a landfill a long time and what's a better option or, why I shouldn't maybe get that styrofoam egg carton. And it's for all ages, so anyone can play it. We also participate in our national night out. We always attend that. It's definitely an opportunity to educate children. It's very children focused. And at that, we purchase um, school supplies that are imprinted with our messages, keep Euclid beautiful and love where you live. It's simple and direct a constant reminder about what how kids want to see their community. And there's a lot of games and families night out. It's right before school starts. So the kids are real anxious to take the supplies off the table and, and fill their bags with the pencils and rulers and other things that we get for them. So this is a really great event. Again, that we attend based solely on, um, we buy the supplies with our funding and education um, from our litter grant. 
So this is a flyer for Keep Eucla Beautiful, and we partner with Keep Ohio Beautiful to clean Sims Park this year. We In Sims Park, we do no less than four major cleanups a year, many other smaller ones. It is such a large park and does have so many beaches and walkways and playgrounds, so that does require quite a bit of care. This is a Euclid resident. Euclid residents are very, very proud, very proud of their city, very proud of their lakefront. They regularly clean up. Um, this is one of them there, and we're always happy to give them supplies and organize the cleanups. Keep Euclid Beautiful is a very good vehicle to keep track of all of that. This is another uh, Case Western Reserve environmental research. We also have two local colleges, Cleveland State and Case Western Reserve, that reach out quite often to do studies down by the lakefront. And anytime someone does a field trip to our lakefront, they always incorporate a cleanup and Keep Euclid Beautiful always gets them supplies and some water um, and t-shirts and things like that. You can see all that. And this is one of our residents, Alana. She attends the, oh, this was her senior project. And she attends the um, Horizon Academy of Science in Cleveland, but she lives here in Euclid. And she had wanted to learn how to organize a cleanup and she is going into environmental studies. So again, Keep Euclid Beautiful was happy to assist that. That's her council person there in the picture and some of her neighbors and her parents that helped us clean up at Sims Park and some Keep Euclid Beautiful team members. You can see the extra trash cans. We have also doubled our trash cans and recycling containers in Sims Park. All of our parks have seen a large increase in visitors, especially the lakefront. Our waterfront trail is now one of the few places on the east side that the public can access the lakefront. So we have seen a huge uptick in visitors there, which has created a lot more trash. Also there new to Sims Park uh, two years ago is a large native plant garden. Uh, it provides education on native plants and pollinators. Dozens of local schools make field trips there every year to teach with the garden. We do um, provide those signs from Keep Ohio Beautiful, Keep America Beautiful, and the Ohio EPA to feature these spots. And we, this one is from Friends of Euclid Creek. They're a very good partner of ours. We do partner on quite a bit to keep the Euclid Creek clean and the watershed clean. And then they have this demonstrative native plant garden in Sims Park. And you can see in the middle, those are all a hand laid stone path from stones from our beach that their volunteers made. And then another new problem, waste we didn't anticipate, but we now have. We have since in 2019 allowed uh, dogs in our parks, which is wonderful, but we found that comes with waste. So Keep Euclid Beautiful is able to also purchase pup stations along Sims Park trails and the boardwalk so people could clean up after their dogs. A very large problem, uh, one of the worst, most common litter things is the cigarette, butt, lit, cigarette butts, especially on our lakefront. Starting in 2019, Keep Euclid Beautiful was able to secure funding through Keep America Beautiful to put cigarette receptacles along the boardwalk install them by the restrooms and trash cans, try to um, pass out literature and make people realize that that is trash too. A lot of people think it's not, but it is. And we will continue to each year secure more funding with the goal of installing cigarette receptacles throughout Euclid by every bus shelter. New for 2021, we're very happy that we're partnering now with the Downtown Cleveland Alliance. On Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have ambassadors at our Lakefront Park every weekend, and they do um, empty trash cans when they get full, they, when they get full from picnics, they pick up trash along the beach, they alert city services if there's anything that needs to be fixed, 
And we also this year added a dedicated park employee just to Sims Park. Again, just because of the addition of the pier and the waterfront trail, um, we really have seen an increase in visitors. And it does help lighten the load uh, for Keep Eucla Beautiful. Another thing we have in coming to Sims Park and two other parks in the city is we're have, we are building litter libraries. And this allows us to stock these. It's kind of like the little food pantries, but with litter supplies and these handy um, litter bags. So if you have trash or a diaper or, you know, you can carry them in your stroller that you can readily get supplies to clean up if you wish. And these are available. They will be stacked um, in each park. And one of these litter libraries is being built in Sims Park. So you can see we've had to think outside the box. There's a lot of different ways to manage litter and it is a complex issue and we try to be creative and we want to do more than just pick it up after it's on the ground. A big part starts by picking it up before it travels into the storm drains. Um, I would like to take a minute to thank our team and I like to call us a team, not a committee. Uh, the Keep Euclid Beautiful team is extremely dedicated. They are all Euclid residents. They volunteer all of their time. None of them are paid. They are very proud of what they do and work extremely hard. I'm very, very fortunate to work with them. And then I'd really like to thank the Ohio EPA. We absolutely could not exist or do any of this without their support or funding. So we really thank you for that. And with that, I will turn it back over to Helen. Thank you so much, Linda. These have just been great presentations, both with both Director Stevenson and Linda. So now we're going to uh, squeeze a couple questions in. I know we're right up against our break time, but I'd, I'd really like to, to fit a few in. Uh, and we have Heidi Griesmer with Ohio EPA that's going to take a couple of these questions. Uh, the first question we have is, how can Ohio EPA support communities that are doing outreach and education efforts to persuade the public to litter less? Um, good morning, this is Heidi. I'm gonna take just a second to introduce myself and then I'll answer the question. Um, as Helen said, my name is Heidi Griesmer and I'm the Deputy Director for Communication at Ohio EPA. Um, and that is a great question. Ohio EPA has and continues to support local communities litter prevention and cleanup efforts through our recycling and litter prevention grant program. As Director Stevenson mentioned earlier in the session, Communities can apply for funding to assist in creating or updating a litter awareness and prevention campaign or for litter cleanup events. Many times communities combine litter outreach and education efforts with physical cleanup events. Both activities complement each other and help reinforce the litter prevention messaging because of the direct involvement with community cleanup volunteers. Okay, and let's squeeze one more question in. How does Ohio EPA support litter prevention and cleanup on a local level? Um, while Ohio EPA is a partner with ODOT and DNR um, on the A Little Litter is a Big Problem campaign, which is a statewide initiative, and you'll hear more about it soon um, in the next session. The true support and work of litter prevention efforts starts with the local community. Often it's a grassroots approach with local partnerships to help these event efforts be set successful and impactful with residents. Ohio EPA supports these local stakeholders through our grant program and promotes past successful grant projects related to litter prevention so other communities can feel inspired to take the next steps to reduce litter in their neighborhood. It's important to have committed partners involved in your local litter prevention projects and Linda Beck gave some great examples during her segment. Okay, thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you everyone for the great presentations and attendees for great questions. If we didn't get to your question, we will follow up with you via email after the summit. Our last session of the summit is highlighting the litter campaign. Our presenter is Amy Dawson. 
Executive Vice President of Falgren More Time. Amy is an industry veteran with more than 30 years of experience. She and her team have worked with a wide range of local, regional, and national businesses, government organizations, and nonprofits. Amy leads her agency's relationship with the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio, and their work together has won several awards. Her focus is helping build brands through integrated marketing campaigns. Respected by colleagues, clients, and peers, Amy is best known for her ability to lead integrated teams that connect well with clients. I'll now turn the mic over to Amy. Hi, everybody, and th thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time this morning to talk about the creative approach that our agency has developed for the statewide litter campaign. So our objective when we first had a conversation with uh, ODNR and ODOT and IEA was to develop a statewide litter prevention campaign that reduces the amount spent on litter abatement by 50% in 2023, but also reduce the collective cost of litter abatement across the state of Ohio. So with that objective in mind, what we did was assign several different creative teams to this project. And our, our goal was to establish a focal point for the campaign, which, sorry about that, which is this, and that is litter is everyone's problem and it's an expensive one. Let's clean up Ohio. So we wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page with understanding what it is we were trying to convey. So when we think about that focal point, we then come up with the campaign goals and that is how do we want people to think, feel, and what do we want them to do? So in, with respect to what we want people to think, that is litter is a big problem in Ohio and I need to take action to help reduce its impact. And then how do we want them to feel? Well, I'm proud to live in Ohio. I want people to understand how litter negatively impacts our state. And at the end of the day, we want to ch change behavior and get people to take action. And that is thinking that I can do my part to keep litter off roadways and public spaces and help others do the same. So we begin with the end in mind by thinking about these goals. And then our uh, focus is how do we come up with messaging that not only uh, reaches, but resonates uh, with our target audience. So the core of the um, campaign is little litter, big problems. So people throw out litter because they think it's no big deal. You know, just like the cigarette butt that was shown in the last presentation, you know, just a little cigarette butt here or a can or two over there. But when you all add it up, it's a huge problem. And to show how big this campaign is, uh, what we decided to do is make litter massive to show the full scale of the issue to give Ohioans really a different perspective on litter and what the impact is to our state. So what you see on this slide are two executions that could be for an ad. This could be for uh, a digital ad. It could be for a print ad. These ideas could then be translated to an out-of-home execution like a billboard or a kiosk. And what you see that we did here is we took the piece of litter, but we exaggerated it significantly to make that strong visual impact right away. So when somebody looks at that, they're like, wow, I mean, that's huge. That hamburger box with the fries in it or that big red solo cup floating in the lake, that's, that's a massive issue. And the copy says, people make a lot of excuses for their litter, and the biggest of all is that their litter doesn't matter. But here's the problem, a little litter is a big problem. Oops. And then we took that and we put it in a social post. So this could be a static post, this could be animated, this could be video, but you can see the execution here is on a playground with trash on the playground, and again, uh, even a little litter is a big problem, and we would want a call to action in here that takes people to learn more. And then the other thing we thought about in this context is video, because video is great at helping people. So to set this up for you a little bit, what we would see is a camera following a discarded um, 
yeah, and just feeding more. And with, you know, that's just feeding coffee. Every tumble of that can or cup down the roadway, it grows inside until it's blocking traffic on both sides of the highway. And the answer would be, it may seem small to you, but littering is a big problem in Ohio, and it affects all of us in surprisingly large ways by trashing up our neighborhoods, nature, and all the places to work and play. Even a litter, little litter is a big problem. Find out why. And then we'd recommend leaking to, to a web page again to learn more. Sorry about that. And then on this slide, we suggest some additional tactics that can be leveraged around the state of Ohio to help extend this message. So these executions could be like a big oversized soda bottle or cigarette butt or bag of trash. It could be a web page takeover on your local news media site with images that align with the, the uh, creative that I just shared on the previous slides. Uh, big litter showing on your screen that makes it difficult to navigate to what you're looking for. We also recommended a speaker series called Buckeye Bag It Up, where we would help get conversations started around litter, whether it's at, um, you know, Kiwanis, Rotary Club, Service Club, uh, any kind of public uh, speaking venue like that. And then the third being, or the fourth being, either like a white paper or news release that talks about the Im economic impact on litter uh, uh, on the state of Ohio. So lots of different ways that this campaign has legs uh, and can be uh, brought to life in a lot of different, unique, and creative ways. Um, I think it's important to also make sure that we give a place to go to a website for more information and uh, uh, later on in this conference be discussed later. Okay, thank you, Amy, for highlighting the campaign. We're going to wrap up the summit with a picture of our new toolkit and stakeholder needs webpage. You can find this at epa.ohio.gov forward slash litter prevention. It provides resources that all attendees can use to prevent and reduce litter. You can see the link at the website at the bottom of the slide. The link is also included in our summit agenda, and we will also include it in our follow-up email. As we learn from our presenters, litter is a growing problem in Ohio. It impacts our transportation system, state parks, beachfronts, and waterways. That's why in April, our governor announced the litter campaign coordinating a statewide effort to raise awareness about the problem of littering and to discourage Ohioans from contributing to the problem. Ohio EPA, ODNR, and ODOT have developed a statewide litter campaign to prioritize and promote the conversation about litter in Ohio, and we need your help. The agencies are seeking local governments, environmentally focused groups, businesses, educational institutions, and additional community organizations to partner with us to spread this message across Ohio. On this page, you will find statistics, brand guidelines, and templates for incorporating this message into your local community, park, or roadside litter prevention efforts. New items are being developed and will be added, so keep looking back for additional resources, suggestions, and partnering opportunities. A list of contacts is also included on the webpage. In the exit survey you'll receive after the summit, we invite you to provide feedback on the summit, provide ideas on other tools you would like to see developed. Let us know what products or support would help you in your efforts to curb litter in your area. And also answer some questions about litter prevention activities. We appreciate your time completing the survey and it will help us to continue to enhance the toolkit. On behalf of Governor DeWine, ODOT, ODNR, and Ohio EPA, thank you for attending our Litter Summit today. If we have not answered your question during the Q&A portion, we will reach out to you via email following today's summit. As I mentioned earlier, this webinar is being recorded and we will post it along with the PowerPoint slides and other handouts to Ohio EPA's YouTube channel. We will email a link to the recording once it's posted. And with that, we will end today's summit. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day.